A bird falls from the sky. Its glossy feathers shuddering against the icy wind. Its eyes are dull and dark. The beak clamped closed. Wings catch the air, and for a second, the bird soars. Then gravity's cruel hand smashes it against the cold earth. The bird is fresh, not long dead. She nudged it with the tip of her shoe to make sure. For some unknown reason, the urge to cry swells in her throat as she stares at its tiny corpse. She glances around, searching for trees, power lines, anything it could have come from. But the stretch of pavement she stands on remains bare of anything overhead. The bird fell out of the sky and landed at her feet. What's wrong, Evermore? You getting teary over a dead sparrow? No. I'm trying to figure out why it's here. Because it's a dead bird? They're everywhere. She points upwards, and he follows her gaze into the cloudless sky. There's nothing above us for it to fall from. Maybe he had birdie cancer, corked it in midair. For real though, why are you so worried? I dreamt about a dead bird last night. A sparrow? I don't know, just a bird. It looked the same as this dude. Their song might be brief, but how greedy would BB be to ask for more? What? It's from the book you lent me, dipshit. Read it again. Anyway, you have a dream about a dead bird and now you're getting the sads over one you found on the pavement. Rose doesn't want to tell him, but in her dream, the bird fell unnaturally from the sky, limp and lifeless. She'd woken with tears on her cheeks and her chest full of sorrow. Finding the dead bird on her walk to school has shaken her, and as her silence lingers, Tyson picks her up and throws her over his shoulder. Hey, uh, what are you doing? Hey, put me down. Tyson ignores her like she knew he would. As he carries her into the school, groups of their classmates watch both go by. She's a witch, a soothsayer, seer of dead birds and prophet of destruction. Rose won't admit it, but she likes that last one. She returns the wave of a bemused classmate and struggles to hide a smile as Tyson puts her down in front of her first class for the day. There. Feel better? By tonight, the yucky bird will be gone. Oh, almost forgot. Thought you'd need breakfast. He hands her a lukewarm can of energy drink from his backpack. Rose takes it, her expression clearing and becoming one of relief. Oh, you legend. I totally forgot. I'll buy next week. Damn straight you will. Bye. He bumps into several students as he departs, and Rose is grinning as she cracks the tab on her can. Inside the classroom, a harried teacher is shepherding the class inside. Welcome everyone, come on in, find a place and sit down, we've got a lot to get to today. Mid-semester career counselling has started up. Rose settles into her favourite desk up the back, one that catches the sun every morning, but even that can't cheer her up from the thought of career counselling. She'd been preparing to feign illness to get out of it, but the dream about the dead bird has thrown her. You got ten minutes to fill out your sheets and then come up and see me for a chat. A sheet of paper is laid on Rose's desk in front of her with a smiley face printed in one corner, as though it can make planning your entire life at 17 any more bearable. She traces it with her pen. It makes it slightly more bearable. When I was younger, I wanted to be... She thinks back to a childhood with Tyson and a conversation that ran along a similar line. A cat! A what? A cat? Why? They get all the best stuff. Food whenever they want, sleeping all day. Man, that's the life, Rose. She imagines answering her sheet with a cat, and it's as though she can hear her teacher's disappointment. Too late, she realizes she's imagined nothing, and Mr. Burgess stands behind her. You have to write something, Rose. I know, it's just... I haven't thought about it. Come on, let's go have a chat. You can have the first appointment. The classroom next door is empty. The teacher sits behind the desk and gestures to the chair in front of it. Rose sits heavily. You haven't thought about what you want to do after high school? You know that's the end of this year, right? Rose is reminded constantly of this fact. She shifts. I know. I'm well aware, believe me. Do you want to go to university? Take a gap year? A what? A year off from studying. You can do anything, but most people travel. 
I enjoyed my time in the United States last year. I'd highly recommend it. Yeah, that could be cool. Rose sits up straighter in her chair, her thoughts full of canyons and bald eagles. Career-wise, though, is there anything you've thought about? I know your mother works at the hospital. Have you thought about following in her footsteps? No, I don't like blood. Well, you like reading, video games, anything to do with those two spark your interest? Her head is still filled with images of leaving the town and traveling to places unseen. A few moments pass before she realizes the teacher is waiting for a response. No, I don't think so, sir. I reckon our appointment's up. It's true. The 9.30 appointment is hovering anxiously outside the window. Concern scrawled across his freckled face. Oops. You're right, Miss Evermore. Off you go. The unsupervised class is blissfully rowdy and talkative when she returns, providing the perfect distraction for her to slip amongst the desks and sit down, realizing too late that she's left her career counseling page in the other classroom. The restaurant, Crispy Burgers, is packed with students fresh out of school. Almost every table is crammed, and the booths overflow. Rose watches a pretty serving girl grin at the distracted cook, then turn to serve the student digging in his wallet. She tears her gaze away as Tyson slams his soda on the table. And the ball definitely went out. I saw it, but the ref didn't call it. So rigged. Every game you lose is rigged. Remember when you thought you'd found the underground betting ring during Milo Cricket? Could you, for once, please not play devil's advocate? Dude, we were five. But I did find money changing hands. Yeah, our registration fee. <laughs> Give me some of your chips. Though the hour is late, Rose is not at home where her mother requested she be after school. With a nervous look at her phone, which remains quiet, Rose pushes it further into her school bag and waits for Tyson to finish his meal. Oh, I want to go. Do you want to come back to mine? Nah, I've actually got some assignments to do. <laughs> Nerd. Let me guess, you've already done the essay. I might have done. Can I copy? No! Tyson continues to try and convince her as they leave the warm, brightly lit establishment and head out into the car park. A chill breeze sweeps past them, bringing a voice to Rose's ears as her hair gusts in the wind. Glossy feathers, shuddering against the wind. What? Mm, I didn't say anything. You all good? Rose goes to respond, but as she does, they both hear the commotion behind a row of parked cars. Rose starts forward, but Tyson takes her by the shoulder. Don't! Rose struggles free and continues to the scene. A small group of students from their high school are gathered around one lone form. The new kid, Russell, also known to Rose as the 9.30 appointment from that morning. Hey! Quit it! Shove off, Evermore. This doesn't concern you. Just... just leave him alone. What did he ever do to you? Ah, oh, he's just some piece of shit from the big city probably reckons he's better than us, don't you prick? He turns and kicks Russell in the ribs, and Rose launches forward to grab him by the arm. Oh, you're not exactly disproving the theory! Another student grabs Rose, and her bravado falters as she struggles to get free. Tyson finally emerges from between parked cars. Enough! Let her go! The rest of you can disappear as well. Go home! They release Rose, and Russell is left alone as the group throws jeers and taunts in their direction, slowly leaving the car park with staggered steps. Rose rubs her arms and returns to Tyson's side as Russell stands, wincing. Are you alright? I'm fine. I hate this shithouse town, though. Russell heads towards the restaurant, leaving Rose and Tyson alone. Tyson puts his arm around her. Come on, you'll be fine in there. Why did you interfere? What was I supposed to do? Just walk on by? Tyson doesn't have an answer for her, and merely shrugs as he steers her back to her car. Sometimes... You can't save everyone. It's late when Rose pulls into her driveway after dropping Tyson off. She lets herself into the darkened house and slings her bag on the shoe stand. Out of habit, she scuffs her shoes on the frayed rug that covers the floorboards, an act her mother has promised she'll gut her for, but one she herself has picked up. Unnerved by the confrontation in the car park, Rose sets about making dinner for her absent mother, knowing she'll be home soon. She tosses a frozen steak into a hot pan, moving the lace curtains aside absentmindedly. As she wanders back into the living room, the heat behind her goes unnoticed until the flames begin to shine on the windows. Shit! She darts back to the fire that now spills across the counter, desperately filling a saucepan with water from the tap. She dumps it into the newborn flames, but falls back as the fire roars and explodes upwards in a ball of black smoke. Oh, shit! Her heart sinks, but she can't tear her eyes from the boiling orange flame. Shades of crimson and gold swirl in pillars of fire. Golden sparks settle on her sleeve as she moves forward. 
Her hands tingle, almost buzzing, and a yearning tugs at her heart. She reaches the palm out, and the fire bends to meet her. Sirens wail down the street, and the moment is broken. Burning smoke fills her lungs, and she rushes, coughing, from the house as the first truck arrives. <coughs> oh, great. Great. Yeah. <clears throat> Mom's gonna be pissed. An hour later, the yard is swarming with firemen. Though the house still smokes, and half the neighborhood has turned out to watch the event, it is the woman standing beside her, throttling a packet of cigarettes, that scares Rose most. I said cook dinner, not burn the house down. Yeah, I know. You know, at 17, I would have hoped that you could have been left alone for a few hours without emergency services being called. Thankfully, at that moment, a man in uniform approaches Christina, sparing Rose the follow-up on the disappointed lecture. She waits until he leaves before asking tentatively, Can we go inside? We have to wait for the building inspector to sign off first. She rubs her face with one hand, Still in her scrubs after a ten-hour shift, she'd been hoping to come home and into pajamas. Instead, she'd come home to the entire Metropolitan Fire Unit on her front lawn. Have you got any of those shitty energy drinks? Rose offers her a crushed stick of gum instead, but is waved off. Christina squeezes the packet of cigarettes, and Rose is immediately on edge. That gesture means a talk is coming. The neighbors who called Triple Zero said they saw you looking at the fire reaching out to it before you ran. Yeah, um, shock works differently for everyone, I guess. If there's anything you ever want to tell me, I promise I'll listen. There's nothing, all right? It was just a kitchen fire. Her mother stares at her for a moment and then tucks the pack of cigarettes away. You know, Rose, there's a trainee ship opening up in reception at the hospital. You really should apply before the end of the week. You've finished your exams. You could start part-time work now. The pay will be crap, but... Can we talk about this later? (sighs) Fine. That night, after the paperwork is signed and the strangers have gone, Rose is unable to sleep. Acrid smoke and the smell of burnt plastic and mothballs have soaked into the familiar house. She creeps out of bed, her socks silent on the stairs. The cupboard in the hall houses her mother's stash of cigarettes and lighters, and it's easy to lift one from the drawer. She takes a deep breath, clicking it into life, and the bright flame springs up eagerly. Rose darts a finger through the white gold teardrop, and it flickers. Shadows close around her small form, but the flame stabilizes and starves them off. This time, she drags her finger over it slowly. There is no pain, no burn, as the fire passes over her skin. Even when she pauses, the heat pressed against her hand, there is nothing. I'm fireproof? The floorboards overhead creak with muffled footsteps, and Rose drops the lighter. It extinguishes before it hits the carpet, but her heart stops for a moment as she scoops it up. She sneaks it back into the drawer as, upstairs, the shower curtain is drawn and the water pipes screech. Rose waits until she's certain her mother is in the shower, then pads upstairs to her room. She lies down in the dark, her vision dancing with flames. Hey, Rose here. When I'm not playing with lighters, I like to play video games, and one of those video games is Against the Storm by Hooded Horse. Hooded Horse has partnered with Sky Nation Publishing to bring you this fantasy podcast. Against the Storm is a roguelike city builder in which you play as the Queen's Viceroy. Lead humans, beavers, lizards, and harpies to reclaim the wilderness, unlock new technologies, and gather resources for the remaining citizens of the smouldering city. Against the Storm is coming to Steam in Q4 of 2022. The link is in the description of the episode, so make sure to wishlist it. Now, uh, back to the episode. Oi, you still haven't told me what we're doing out here. It's cold as shit. I thought we could build a fire, you know, like when we were kids. She dumps her armful of branches on the growing pile at her feet and dusts her hands. Tyson looks apprehensive and hasn't moved to help her gather material. Instead... He waits for her to look back at him. And you just decided this, now, even after the kitchen fire the other night? That was an accident, and it was like a nothing fire. Few curtains went up, lots of smoke. Honestly, the tiniest, least impressive thing you've ever seen in your life. Hmm, I don't know. 
I've seen you. Wow. Rude. No, but seriously, are you all good? Is your mum being weird about the end of the year again? Yeah, a bit. Some traineeship in administration is opening up at the hospital, she wants me to apply, and I literally could not think of anything I want to do less. So you're building fires in your backyard? Yeah, it's cold. Fine. All right. Together, they work in the backyard of Rose's childhood home, gathering dried branches and sticks from the park behind her house. The pile grows taller, until Tyson looks about for fire lighters to set some of the smaller tinder burning. Where did your mum keep the burners? I have a better idea. Tyson watches as she lifts the bright red jerry can, previously hidden behind their old swing set, and begins to pour clear liquid across the branches. The strong smell of petrol makes his eyes water. Ah, uh, where did you get that? The garage. She takes a lighter from the pocket of her jacket. You should probably take a step back. Wait, don't! He's cut off by the sudden explosion of heat and flame. He staggers back and falls, his arm over his face to shield himself from the sudden flare. But Rose stands beside the new inferno. The warmth sinks into her clothes and skin, brushing her hair back from her face. She waits for the burn to come, and when it doesn't, she moves forward. This is probably going to hurt. Tyson watches, horrified, as Rose plunges her arm into the flames. Her eyebrows knit together, as though expecting pain, but instead, she withdraws an arm on fire and turns it so the blaze is contained in her palm. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. <laughs> what the? Wait, how, how did you know you could do that? Because I did it before. Tyson, I'm... I'm fireproof. Tyson gets to his feet and approaches his friend, watching the flames flicker in her hand. No way. This has to be a trick. What? How could this be a trick? I... I don't know. Maybe my brain is grabbing at any possible explanation. Because otherwise, my best friend of 16 years is holding a handful of fire. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, I, I guess it is. He turns toward a sound she doesn't hear, and when his hand comes down on her shoulder, she loses whatever focus was keeping the flames contained. She gasps as pain spreads down her arms, her jacket smoldering. She frantically shrugs her way free of it, leaving it burning on the ground. What? What, what did you say? I said your mum is home. The screen door screeches open with a sound that sets their teeth on edge. Rose Evermore. You know, I think I preferred the fire. <sighs> Honestly, me too. Christina is waiting by the door as the two trudge inside, Rose pausing to pick up her ruined jacket. Tyson slinks past the woman in the doorway, shoulders hunched, and Rose resists the urge to do the same. Both gather in the kitchen as the screen door crashes closed. Of all the irresponsible behaviour, I expected better from you, Tyson Wells. Sorry. From him? Yes, from him. Because, unfortunately, Rose... I know you, reckless, uncaring, doing whatever you want, whenever you want. Nothing matters to you. Nothing has consequences, does it? And as you're getting older, it's less endearing. It's troublesome. Quite frankly, it's bullshit. Should I go? Don't- Yes, go. I need to talk to my daughter alone. Tyson scuttles from the room, stopping to scoop up his backpack. Both Evermores listen to the front door close softly, and Rose braces for the shitstorm of the century. Christina thumbs open the packet of cigarettes, lighting one between her lips. She sits heavily at the table. Rose watches the familiar routine. Rose, is there anything you'd like to tell me? Instead of answering, Rose looks at the cat-shaped clock above the sink. She watches the swinging tail count off the seconds, then places her phone on the table and switches on the flashlight app. A moment later, the power goes out, plunging them both into darkness. The bright beam of light from her phone illuminates the kitchen. Same question. It's not just the fire. I've been having dreams too, and the next day I see what was in those dreams. I, th I think I'm seeing the future. I think we should talk to a therapist. There is a beat of silence before Rose throws her phone at the wall. Even after I proved it to you, I, I gave you a demonstration. You set yourself on fire. If I hadn't come home when I did, would you have turned up in the ER? She grabs her daughter's wrist and pulls her close, but Rose's skin is unmarked. Christina turns her arm this way and that, 
her eyes wide. That's not possible. I saw you on fire. Your jacket is burned to a crisp. How are you not burnt? I, I held the fire. Christina says nothing. And when Rose looks up, her mother's eyes are wide. A second later, she stands from the table and leaves the kitchen. Where are you going? Away. Away? From what? Everything. You. I need to think. She begins to climb the stairs to her room, and Rose follows closely on her heels. What have I done wrong? You you can talk to me. You can trust me. I'm an adult. You are a child. I can't trust you not to burn down the kitchen. Can't trust that you'll make the most of the opportunities I fight to give you. (laughs) What opportunities? Like what? Did you apply for the traineeship at the hospital? No, I didn't think so. Has it ever occurred to you to ask what I want to do? You know, Rose, I would, if I thought you knew the answer. She disappears up into the house, leaving Rose standing on the stairs, wanting but failing to refute her mother's words. And even when the power returns an hour later, the house remains dark. After the backyard fire, the Evermores hardly see each other. They operate on different schedules, living different lives. It appears to suit them both. Despite not applying for the traineeship, Rose still receives a phone call thanking her for her application. But unfortunately, she was not successful. She receives this call on the same day she officially fails three of her four classes. The brochure is given to her by Mr. Burgess remain crumpled at the bottom of her school bag as the dream of leaving Narrowlong begins to fade. So, what? You can hold fire and predict random happenings during the day? Seems that way. That kid's about to eat shit. From their seat underneath the giant tree in the middle of the yard, both watch as one of the younger students suddenly stumbles on a loose brick and face plants. Your mum just hasn't talked to you at all since the fire? (laughs) Which one? The one, I guess, we started. You didn't start shit. She's not mad at you. It was my idea, so I'm the one copying it. And no, she hasn't spoken to me. She just goes to work, comes home, drinks a beer, and goes to sleep. Avoids me at all costs, which, you know, she's probably right. I wouldn't want a kid like me either. Don't say that. Why not? It's true. School ends this year, and where do I go from here? Oh, actually, with the uh, class failures this morning, I'll probably have to repeat. Repeating my final year of high school. Living in my mum's house. That is the dream, Ty. The dream. No, you've been having dreams. And I think they're trying to tell you something. I don't know how to say this, Rose, but normal people can't hold a ball of fire and predict the future. Wow, really? What losers? But his comment has her thinking. There is a dream she keeps having. Night after night, she is visited by the image of a turbulent river, of the waiting paper bark trees that lean over the water, beckoning as though to tell her a secret. In the dream, she can feel the whispered wind on her cheeks, the damp river mud pressing against her shoes. Every night she's had it, she's woken with her feet on the ground, upright, as though to walk somewhere. Rose decided long ago that she preferred to dream about dead birds. I know shit sucks right now, but you're capable of a lot more than you think, Rose. I don't know about that, but thanks, man. The school day drags to a close. As the lazy sun lowers itself to the horizon and the horn sounds from broken speakers, a flood of teenagers leave faded yellow demountables in packs of three or four. One lone figure winds her way through the crowd, pressing against the tide, heading to the school oval. Behind that oval is a bushland of short scrub and faded gum trees, and twisting between it all is a long, brown river, which cuts the township in half. Rose manages to find the boardwalk beneath the bridge, her footsteps hollow in the old wood. The river flows silently, appearing calm on the surface. But Rose has lived in Narrowlong her entire life. Water safety was taught from a young age. With this in mind, she pauses and takes off her shoes. Rose? What are you- oh my- Uh, I just- I needed a walk. Without your shoes? Maybe I just needed a swim? In the river? The river is gross, Rose. You know that. What are you doing out here? You're right. I can hold fire and predict the future, and lately, all I see is the water. Something's down there, Ty. 
Something's waiting for me. Yeah, old shopping trolleys and God knows what. Dude, come on. You're having a rough day. Just, just let me see first. She takes a step off the boardwalk and Tyson moves forward. She ignores him, leaving her shoes and school bag behind. He wrinkles his nose as her socks meet the riverbed. Ugh, Rose, come on. It's disgusting down there. Above them, the sound of traffic roars across the patchwork stone bridge. Swirls of graffiti color the underside of it, and the riverbank at low tide features random bits of garbage that people have tossed in it. Rose pauses, feeling an odd bit of kinship. The water laps at her toes, soaking her socks. There is something down there, Tyson. I have to see it for myself. Don't! He is already bounding forward as she steps into the water. His hand seizes the back of her jacket, and she turns to fight him off. But gravity has decided where they will land, and they fall together. The water submerges them both. Tyson? The river around her is turbulent, furious and unbridled. Nothing like the abused suburban river she stepped into. The current dumps her again, and when she comes up, sputtering through strands of hair, she spots her friend closer to the bank. She kicks her legs, grateful she thought to take her shoes off, and struggles to the riverbank. When she seizes handfuls of thin grass, she realizes it's raining heavily, making it harder to breathe, even above the surface. You good? Before she can answer, strong hands grip hers and hauls her from the river like a soggy fish. Her legs nearly fold when her rescuer stands her up on her feet, and she resists the urge to collapse. Stay there, girl. The man throws a rough blanket around her shoulders. Then he turns to heave Tyson from the river as well. He is also given a blanket. Then the man leads him back to where Rose still stands, shivering in the rain. Follow me, quickly. He begins to walk through the twisting trees. Tyson stares at the back of the man's head as though he's sizing him up, and Rose shakes her head. The man towers over both of them, and she suspects he could throw Tyson back into the river with one hand and throttle the life out of her with the other. For now, they had little choice but to obey him. Where are you to- Not to worry, not to worry. I'm taking you to my daughter. She'll get you both sorted out. Sorted out? They emerge from the trees, and the fear in Rose's stomach deepens. Gone is the narrow long bridge, the sound of peak hour traffic. The paper bark trees have been replaced with thick scrub, and black mud sloshes around her feet. Rain pecks at their faces, and Rose's shivers increase as they step onto a hard-packed dirt road. Ahead, buildings begin to emerge from the drizzle. Over there. That house is mine. Get inside. Out of the rain. We'll warm you up. So, what is going on? The man doesn't answer, darting forth in the rain and looking to and fro. Neither Rose nor Tyson see anyone else, but they follow quickly as the man climbs onto a wooden porch, opens the front door, and pushes them inside. Relief from the rain is nearly instant. A fire burns in the hearth, a large cooking pot hanging over it, Dried herbs hang along the back wall, and Rose jumps as a young woman steps forth, her eyes wide. Dad, what are you... We talked about this, and I thought we decided it was too dangerous. Two of them, Layla. We, we got two. Excuse me? Can we have some explanation for what the hell is going on, please? Layla casts a dark look at her father, but ushers them into chairs before the fire as both drip rainwater onto the swept flagstones beneath their feet. <sighs> Sit down. Please. They sit as she turns her back to them, scooping something from the pot over the fire. Tyson looks around the room, but Rose keeps her eyes on the woman who turns back to them with mugs in hand. What's in it? Warm mead. I find it the best remedy for a dip in the river. Thanks. It's... wow, it's really good. Tyson places his mug on the floor as Rose finishes hers. Look, you're both great, but I'm really confused as to what's going on here. It's not our place to say- You're going to learn magic, up at the academy, and when you do, please remember our help, or feel free to call on us. Magic? Magic? Right, sure, okay. Come on, Rose, we're going home. But the fire in the hearth sparks and pops as Rose stands. Embers soar from the logs and settle on her outstretched hand, covering her skin like a gauntlet made of burning coals. You're a fire whisper. A what? Ooh, what the hell? Rose, that is way different from just holding fire. Rose lets the embers go. They drift from her hand, flickering and dying on the cold flagstones beneath her feet. Do you not know about magic, boy? I don't have any magic. If you want weird fire bullshit, she's got you covered. 
You brought a human-born non-magi here. He followed me into the river. I, I didn't know that it was going to take me here. No more. We cannot know what happens when the headmasters call you from the other. We have to send him back or, or hide him. S something. They'll kill him otherwise. What? Why? I'll get it back. Welcome to Lotheria, Fire Whisper. Three loud knocks pound at the door. The scene around the fireplace goes silent as all four look towards the voices that now sound on the other side. They're here. Her father appears with a satchel, which he tosses to his daughter. She catches it and takes Tyson by the arm. We have to go. Now. Whoa, hang on. I'm not going anywhere without Rose. You have to, boy. She's their student. You're not supposed to be here. So what? They'll kill him just for that? <sighs> They've killed others for less. Layla gasps, drawing their attention to the door. The iron locks grow orange, smoke curling from the wood beside them. Tyson, hey, hey, go with her. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Tyson clenches his jaw, but allows Layla to pull him from the room as the locks give way. The door slams open, and Rose turns to face the men who appear on the ruined threshold, silhouetted against the grey sky. Hey, this episode is sponsored by Hooded Horse, indie game publisher of titles such as Terra Invicta. This 4x strategy game follows an alien invasion that fractured humanity into seven factions, each with a unique vision for the future. Lead your chosen faction to take control of Earth's nations, expand across the solar system, and battle enemy fleets in tactical combat. The demo of Terra Invicta is linked in the episode description. Give it a try and make sure to wishlist the game, and thank you for listening to this episode of Her Crown of Fire. No one says anything as a smaller man moves indoors, almost sauntering. He wears a cream tunic trimmed with gold, and a crest on his left shoulder depicts a bird, wrought in silver thread. Around his waist is a belt, looped and tied off, from which hangs a sword, a small dagger, and a leather purse. He sets eyes on the pair. My report said two students were pulled from the river. Your part was wrong. It's only her. Rose wipes her eyes on the corner of the blanket, but doesn't say anything. When she looks up, the stranger is staring at the fire behind her, burning bright and clean in the heart. Very well. Come along, then. Where am I going? These people have been nothing but nice to me, and I'm not going anywhere with you until I know who you are and where you're taking me. One of the burly men frowns and takes a step forward, but stops as the first holds up a hand. No, they are reasonable questions. My name is Eustace Greattree, and I am first page of the Academy, a position held in some esteem. You are one of their newest students, and I have been sent to ensure your safe collection. It's best to go with him, girl. Rose hesitates, but moves across the room towards the door. It takes every ounce of her being not to look for Tyson, but she steps across the threshold and immediately begins to shiver in the wind. This way. It would be wise not to mention your little excursion to anyone at the academy. Why not? Eustace doesn't respond, instead leading her to a waiting carriage. He helps her into the back and seats himself opposite her, sitting tall and proud. Rose looks around as the carriage begins to move, the horse's hooves echoing against the cobbles. Where are you taking me? The academy is at the center of Fairhaven, and the township serves it well. You will see all manner of buildings and trades and merchants before we enter the academy grounds. I understand this is quite different to where you're from, but everything will have an answer soon. Rose looks around as they continue further into the town, Fairhaven. People move to the side as they enter a square, surrounded by stone buildings with wooden shutters. There are no cars, no bicycles, no scooters that zip through the pedestrians. Instead, there are mules pulling wagons, people moving things by cart. The square is lively and bustling, all of it completely unfamiliar and intimidating to Rose. I know this is all a little much. You will adjust. I, I want to go home. And you shall. Welcome to your new home, the Stanthor Academy, the biggest in all of Lotharia. A castle made of strong gray stone rises before them, dwarfing any of the other buildings she's seen until now. Lead-like windows pepper the front, and two narrow towers stand tall on either side of the main door, stretching above the battlements crowning the expansive structure. The carriage steers around to the northern side, and a large wooden gate opens to receive them. They emerge into a courtyard, 
bustling with horses and people. But the carriage begins to slow suddenly, and Eustace stands to see what the cause is. Out of the way, Thompson! Ugh, common as. A small stable boy tries to bow and keep up the fight with the horse on the other end of the lead, who breaks away and trots to the carriage, reins trailing. Rose leans over the side and picks them up as the boy comes running. Thank you, miss. I'm so sorry. Haku is bigger than she seems, and it's hard to hang on sometimes. It's all right. Don't worry about it. Don't concern yourself with the likes of him. Come along. He jumps down and offers her a hand, but she ignores it and climbs down herself. Eustace opens a large wooden door for her, allowing her to enter the intimidating building they saw from the outside. Immediately, silence falls across her shoulders as the remaining raindrops settle on her skin. She shivers. Inside, the stone corridor waits like a yawning maw of an unknown creature. This way! He leads her through a maze of silent stone hallways. She leaves damp footprints behind her on the flagstones, holding her elbows against the chill, her breath misting in front of her. She follows obediently until they enter a large hall, and her gaze is drawn upwards to the ceiling. There, she stops, taking in the thousands of intricate golden shapes, interlinking across the ancient stone. Rose stretches tall on her tiptoes as her guide realizes she is no longer following. Please, we have a schedule to keep. What are they? Decorations, I think. I do believe they were the work of a previous student for some master project or such. At his encouragement, Rose leaves the beautiful carved ceiling and follows him deeper into the building. Together, they descend a set of stone stairs lined with bracketed torches, whose flames lean towards Rose as she passes. Her step slow, considering reaching out to it, but then Eustace looks over his shoulder. Not far to go. Nearly there. Rose decides to leave the fire and continues to follow him down a tower's worth of stairs. Her legs wobble when they reach the polished tile floor at the bottom. Here, the fire in the torches burns green and bright, illuminating the small chamber they stand in. Across from them, a large pair of double doors stand against the steady green light, and Eustace crosses to a small stone basin, dabbing himself with the water within. As he picks up a stone pendant hanging from a long cord, Rose moves forward as though to take one herself. She stops when he lifts a hand. Oh, no. This protection is only for me. You must experience the chamber with no defense except for that which you bring yourself. My fire? Not all strength comes from your magic. He gestures to the door. Rose remains rooted on the spot, but then steps forward as he grips the bronze handle and heaves. A cold gust of wind blasts from the dark abyss the door had hidden, sweeping his hair back from suddenly clammy skin. Rose passes him, stepping into the inky darkness. I wish you luck, and hope to see you on the other side. He closes the door. Whoa, 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 hey, wait, 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 wait. Her fingers meet smooth stone where the door should be, sending her nails scrappling across the surface, searching for cracks, handles, anything that might allow her to grasp hold. Okay, yeah, vanishing doors, cool, that's fine, <laughs> totally normal. I've fallen through a magic river into a magic land where people are horrible and the doors don't exist. Mmm, yeah, this is way better than career counselling. Good choice, Rose. Solid decision making here, as usual. Ghostly grey light dawns behind her, and she spins on the spot. A long cave yawns before her, pockmarked with jagged rock and broken stalagmites. The cavern reaches far above her head, where moss hangs in dripping strings. She cranes her head back, trying to see farther. But all she receives is an eyeful of cave water. Oh, oh gross. Oh, yeah, that's just, that's just awesome. Ugh. I... Hello? A faint noise reaches her on a thin breeze, and her belly drops as she recognizes the sound of someone crying. She is not alone in this cavern. For a moment, Rose cannot breathe. The thin crying carries to her, unearthly in its pain. The voice echoes off of the stone walls of the cavern, and fear locks itself into every bone in her body. Her hand rests on a stalagmite, and without thinking, she begins to climb. Her feet, still clad in damp socks, slip a few times, but the idea has taken hold, and she scrambles to the top 
to get a better look at the cavern. It's not real. It can't hurt you. It's not real, so it can't hurt you. Why couldn't it be real? The crying continues, and Rose suddenly hears the skittering of paws on stone. Several dark shapes slink forth, the gray light of the cavern absorbing into their matted fur. From her vantage point, Rose can see the mouth of the cavern and the burning torch that sits beside a hunched, cloaked figure. The small pack of creatures head for her, and beady eyes glint in the darkness. Their yips and snarls fill the space as the woman stops crying, turning to face the threat. She will die if you do nothing. Make your choice, Rose Evermore. Indecision grips Rose and holds her. Then, she begins to climb down, blind in the dark, her heart slamming in her chest. When her feet meet the stone floor, she fumbles forward. Something soft meets her hands, and she reels back. Her eyes can make out the shape of a man, chained and bound to the wall. Oh my god, are you alright? Hello, sir? The man does not stir, and a cry echoes through the cave. Rose looks up, her eyes locking on to the firelight. What is this place? But her decision is made. Leaving the chained man, she runs for the fire. The creatures are leaping at the hooded woman, snagging at her cloak, and Rose reaches for the torch she's dropped. The flames jump to her hands as though they'd been waiting, and she sweeps them at the attacking animals. They skitter back, hissing and snarling, but one ducks the fiery assault and locks its teeth into her arm. Ugh! Rose cries out but pushes it away, leaving her bleeding fiercely. The fire spreads, lighting the cave, and the mangy pack flees the pair. Ah, are you... are you alright? What were they? The woman doesn't answer. She looks at Rose her face cast in shadow from her burning hands. Then, without warning, turns and runs from the cavern, disappearing into the blizzard beyond. Hey, wait, wait! Ugh! Ah, ah. You're welcome, I guess. She takes a step as though to follow the woman outside, but the ground vanishes beneath her feet, and suddenly, she is falling. Clutching her bleeding arm, Rose squints through the clouds and gasps as the rain-soaked landscape begins to take shape below her. As first the township forms, then the castle, a small stable boy looks up and drops his shovel just as she slams into the ground. Rose awakens in a small, comfortable room. Stone walls adorned with tapestries and a small, lead-like window meet her blurred gaze. She struggles to sit upright holding her bandaged arm, the gauze marked with dried blood. Pain racks her every movement, but all things considered, she feels pretty good. <sighs> oh, God, where am I now? Hello? Ah. Her arm twinges as she gets out of the low bed and pulls on the pair of tall boots placed beside it. She tucks in the overly long pants cuffs and then carefully pokes her arm through the jacket slung over the bed frame. Efforts to put her injured arm through the other sleeve prove fruitless, and she drapes the leather over the arm she holds close to her body. The small wooden door at the end of the room isn't locked, and Rose emerges onto an open-air balcony, her breath misting in the chill. She shivers, pulling the jacket a little tighter, then moves towards the staircase that seems to lead further into the building. She shouldn't be awake yet, sir. Her experience in the chamber seemed more intense than most. Yes, uh, physical injuries, that's right. Nothing long-term. Your student will be in excellent health for the start of classes. Don't you worry, sir. I'll check on her right away, and bring her to you if she's awake. Rose presses against the wall as Eustace's footsteps begin to climb the spiral staircase. She nearly falls as the stone at her back gives way, revealing a long, dark tunnel. She looks to the stairs, then back again and decides to take her chances with the darkness. Darting inside, she pushes the false wall back into place with her good hand. Eustace's steps pass her a few moments later. That was probably a dumb move. Oh, what the hell is going on? I need to find Tyson and get out of this place. She feels her way down the steps in the dark. Once or twice, she tries in vain to call fire to her good hand, but the wounds on her arm twinge, and she gives up. The short staircase ends with a narrow gap in the wall, 
and she squeezes past a tall statue to emerge in a fine hallway. Recognizing it, her steps hasten to carry her into the stable yard. Miss! You shouldn't be out here. Excuse me, miss? Hey! I don't suppose you could tell me how to get into the town? It's right outside that gate, and the main township is through the square, but you shouldn't be out of the castle yet. The headmasters want to see you. Ah, it's all good. I'll see them when I get back. Reckon you can leave that gate open for me? I don't know. What if I bring you a present or something? Kids like presents, right? I don't know. I've never gotten one. Uh, wow. Okay, oh, that was surprisingly tragic. Just let me leave, and I'll see you again soon. Okay? She darts away from the small boy before he can answer, following a cart through a smaller wooden gate. Her heart hammers in her chest, but no one stops her as she steps into the square. Around her, the townsfolk bustle about their daily business. No one pays her any mind. Clutching her arm and ducking amongst the foot traffic, Rose disappears into the crowd. Okay, so we turned into the square from here and came up a long street, yes, that had some buildings. Ah, oh, shit. Excuse me, are you lost? No, no thank you. I'm fine. Are you sure? What are you looking for? Uh, my friend. Look, there he is, over there. As the man turns to look, Rose takes off running in the opposite direction. Hey! She holds her arm close and barrels down the nearest alleyway, but it's blocked by pallets and barrels. Undeterred, she takes a running leap at it and begins to climb awkwardly until her strong arm snags her around the waist. You're determined, I'll give you that. Let go! Ah! Ow, 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 ow. What happened here? Yeah, it sounds crazy. I don't think it's even real. The man sets her on the ground, but keeps a firm grip on her good arm. Hmm. I've recognized these kinds of wounds. I've no idea how you got gotten this far, Sal, so start talking. All right, fine. A weird dog bit me, and then I fell out of the sky. <laughs> Not that unbelievable. Really? You're a student at the academy, aren't you? This kind of thing happens a lot. A Jew! Belong back in the castle. Before they notice you're missing. He begins to haul her through the alleyway, back the way she'd run. But Rose winces. Ow, 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 wait, 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 wait. Ah, great. Yeah, they're bleeding again. He stops and pulls up her sleeve to look at the freshly stained bandage. The wounds didn't close. I'm guessing they don't know how to treat him down there. Oh, good. Well, I'm really hoping you do. Because it burns, and not in a fun way. <sighs> Come on, back to my shop. Uh... Or I could call town guard and let them know they have an escaped student. All right, settle down, settle down. Fine, 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 fine. Just, just no guards, please. He nods, then looks about before guiding her down another long street. As they walk, Rose feels for the fire itch in her blood, the one that has been absent since she awoke. But it's there now, weak and listless. But she isn't defenseless against this man. The cobbles disappear, replaced by thick mud, as they emerge into a different district. Stone houses become wooden ones, their roofs thatched with old straw. Wood smoke thickens the air as hammers ring out from open shops. This one. Keep your head down, girl. Rose ducks a curious gaze from a passerby and slips through the doorway he indicates. Inside, a forge sits in the center of the room, coals glowing. They brighten as Rose nears, and the man notices. Another fire mage. Been a while since they've had one. What do you mean? Uh, I don't want to tell you anything they haven't. They haven't told me anything. They dumped me in a cave with a chained up dude and this crying lady who was being attacked by all these bitey little creatures. And then as a reward, uh, I was dropped out of the sky onto my face. God's touched. You're twice curse girl. God's touched. To fall from the sky and walk away. Yeah, the gods are watching you. And you have my pity. He peels away the last layer of bandage and Rose winces. He turns her arm this way and that examining the puncture wounds which sit open, tinged green in the firelight. I know what did this, just let me think for a moment. Sure. Take your time. He gets up and rifles through a nearby shelf. Rose hears the clinking of glass bottles until he emerges with a small one, which she unstoppers. 
Are you gonna introduce yourself? I think the less we know about each other, the better. You have a lot to learn about Lotharia, little fire mate. Hold your arm out. This might sting. Ow! Oh. How does it feel like a toothache got set on fire? That means it's working. That'll let the wounds close up and begin to heal. I'm guessing whoever patched you up didn't know what the cause was. Probably a southerner. <clears throat> I'm gonna take you back to the academy now. Can I trust you'll stay there? I'm not promising anything to someone that won't give me their name. You're welcome for patching you up. Come on. Rose hops off the chair and massages her arm. She won't admit it, but it already feels better. Together, they emerge into the rain and retrace their steps towards the castle. He points at the gates that guard the stable yard. Go through those gates. Don't tell them where you came from. And if I'm very lucky, we'll never meet again. Yeah, all right. Hey, thank you. The man lingers for a moment, his dark eyes meeting hers. Then, he turns abruptly, disappearing into the evening crowd. Rose hesitates, looking back to the stable yard gates. I am sorry, Mr. Blacksmith, dude, but I have to find Tyson. Instead of heading for the gates, Rose waits for a moment, then vanishes into the crowd, away from the imposing castle against the twilight sky. Feel like creating your own medieval village? Hopefully you run it a bit better than this lot. This episode is brought to you by Hooded Horse, publisher of the highly anticipated city builder, Manor Lords. Manor Lords is a medieval strategy game featuring in-depth city building, large-scale tactical battles, and complex economic and social simulations. Rule your lands as a medieval lord. The seasons pass, the weather changes, and cities rise and fall. Manor Lords is coming to Steam soon, so make sure to wishlist this one using the link in the episode description. Cheers for listening to this episode of Her Crown of Fire. The rain holds off as Rose heads to the opposite side of the town, away from the blacksmith and his shop. No one pays her any mind, including the two guards, clad in black armor, smoking and laughing together on the corner of the street. Rose ducks her head, moving past them with the crowd. The houses and taverns thin, replaced by open workshops. Rose watches a carpenter turn a length of wood, shavings falling to the mud. An apprentice stacks pallets of clear glass, his face lined with concentration. Rose wanders the craft district, passing painters and potters, but there is no sign of Tyson. Her footsteps carry her to the river docks, a large building towering over the banks. Two boats are being loaded with barrels as men yell to one another. The air smells sweaty and heavy, thick with the scent of alcohol. Rose turns away after examining the dockmen, missing the two who begin to stride up the low hill towards her. Oi! Ah, come on, Jiren. I thought you said she was pretty. Didn't get a good look at her till now, did I? You watching the boats, girl? Yeah, but I was just leaving. Oh, nah, they're good boats. Oh, we could uh, show you up close if uh, you want. Uh, no thank you. I'm just heading back into town. Where are you from? Uh, around. Out of town, I guess. We could show you the sides, all the good places to be. How about it? Yeah, no thanks. No offence, but it's getting dark and I... I think I'm gonna head home. Ah, oh, you reckon you're too good for us, huh? Yeah, that's how it always goes. Rose mumbles something and begins to walk back towards the busier streets. Flustered, she takes a wrong turn and stares at the dead-end alley with dread filling her stomach. Carefully, she turns to find both men blocking the street. You know, I don't mind that she's not so pretty. Grab her, Eric. The adrenaline in her blood sets Rose's hand aflame and she holds it aloft the small fire illuminating the alley in flickering light. Both men pause. And she's a baby mage. Well, I never. Cool. Praise to you, girl. you just become much more valuable to us. Leave me alone. I mean it. you still got that cousin up north. That trader. Yeah. And he's looking for new stock, too. He'd play a small fortune for an untrained mage. Come on, girl. 
We don't want to damage the product. Rose suddenly understands why the blacksmith had been so insistent as she go right through the gates. She holds her bandaged arm close, but swipes at Jaren with her flaming hand as he makes a grab for her. Sparks wash over his stained shirt. Hey, we ain't gonna hurt ya. Rose is too frightened to respond. As Jaren again tries to grab her, she ducks his hand and then plants hers on his shoulder. The material catches easily, and the man yelps as he realizes he's ablaze. As he pats at himself frantically, Rose takes a desperate running kick forward, planting her foot between his legs. He staggers away as Eric closes the distance. Oh, none of that. We're trying to be careful with you. Rose turns to face him, emboldened by her victory and the fire burning in her blood. But Eric is smarter and quicker, and pain replaces her bravado as he grabs her injured arm. With a cry of pain, she faces him as he whirls her around. She headbutts him, half blinding herself in the process. Both stagger away from each other, but Rose lashes out with a clumsy punch and makes contact with an ear. Howling pain spears through her skull as she pushes past him, but she blinks it away and runs. Jaren is still on fire. With a glance at both men, Rose shoves her burning hand into her pocket and flees into the streets of Fairhaven. I left the gate open like you said, miss. Did you have a nice walk? Uh, sure, kid. I didn't find what I was looking for, though. He looks at her hopefully, and she remembers her promise. She reaches into her pocket, pulling out the small bottle of liquid the smith had used to patch up her arm. Here you go. Thank you. What is it? No idea. Don't drink it. He bows over the small bottle and runs off. Rose rubs her face with her hand and sets off into the castle, her footsteps quiet against the thick carpet. Her weariness nearly deafens her to the rapid-fire pleas of a man begging for freedom. I told him it was only the girl. She was cold and shivering. I brought her to be close to the fire. Hey, shut it! You'll make your pleas to the headmasters. Rose stands frozen for a moment, her stillness cloaking her in shadow. The men continue on down the hall, and she hesitates before following them. Her heart in her throat, she hangs back as the men drag Layla's father deeper into the castle, but stays close. Personally, I reckon they'll take the whole hand. What's it you do for a job? Nothing after this. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Both men peer down the hall, and Rose prays the gloom hides her form. Silence ticks past with the minutes, and finally, one of them moves again. I told you this place is haunted. It has every reason to be. Come on. In here. Mark on Pike. Now this is someone I never thought I'd see brought before us for wrongdoing. With all due respect, madam, there was no wrongdoing. I saw a girl in the rain, cold and lost, and I only wanted to make sure she was all right. We were going to send for the academy. Lies. Very good ones, I'll grant you, but lies nonetheless. What cause do you have to serve us this grievance, Mr. Pike? Your daughter, I'm guessing. Recently out of work, unmarried, a nothing person really. No special talents or looks. You needed an inn. You needed a student. Rose peers around the corner, anger burning in her chest at the thought of this woman speaking about Layla so. The speaker is a woman in fine robes, her long white hair streaked with black and twisted into a rope that lies over her shoulder. More black armored guards line the walls. At the end of the table, a man in a pale coat and spectacles watches, his impassive face twitching occasionally. Another man sits in the corner, his face cloaked in the shadows cast by the torch brackets. As for the second person you pulled from the river, there was no second. It was just the girl. Rose holds her breath, waiting to see if they'll accept the lie. Your reports are slipping, Hall. Sorry, Mom. We had to write to the governor in Castor. Never before has someone taken a human born into their home before the academy finds them. Your audacity, Markham Pike, is going to get you killed. Fortunately for you, that day is not today. Hold out your hand. Rose, realizing what is about to happen, gets up from her crouched spot near the door. 
and flees. She nearly makes it to the end of the corridor before the thump of a knife carries to her ears, accompanied by a cry of pain. She skids to a halt, her hands over her ears, breathing heavily. She turns the corner with tears in her eyes. Good evening, Miss Evermore. The man rises from where he'd been sitting against the stairs, towering over her in the dark. Fire, the color of rust, lights on his palm, illuminating her tear-stained cheeks. How kind of you to finally join us. You were missing from the address today. What were you hoping to find out in Fairhaven? Nothing. Um, your way out of this place. <laughs> How candid of you. I'm afraid you'll find no way to leave Lotheria, Miss Evermore. This is your home now. The sooner you understand that, the less people will get hurt on your behalf. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Tonight I will let you return to your rooms. But this was not his mistake, it was yours. When you did not arrive this morning, we went out looking for him. You are our student, and you belong here. Remember what you saw, what you did and understand that it will be the first of many lessons you will learn in this world. Good night, Miss Evermore. We will be calling on you. Soon. Hey, Tyson. It, uh... It feels really stupid talking to nothing in my room and hoping you can hear me. But I've been in this world for less than two days, and I've seen some really crazy shit. So who knows? Maybe this will work. I saw a man get his finger cut off last night, and they told me it was my fault. And now, I can't help thinking that anything that happens to you, that's... That's my fault too. I'm going to find you, Tyson. Whether you slept in the gutter or... or found somewhere to hole up, I'm gonna find you. And then, we're busting out of this place. <clears throat> Come in. Breakfast, my lady. Uh, call me Rose, please. Where would you like me to put it? Uh... Yeah, the, the desk for now, I think. Rose waits for her to leave, then approaches the breakfast tray. Though her stomach is knotted with anxiety, the scent of toasted bread and fresh tea draws her in closer. Eating quickly, she crumples a bit of toast and stuffs it into her pocket for later. After dressing quickly, she opens the door to find the maid standing outside it, like a tiny sentinel in a linen cap. You're not meant to go anywhere without an escort, miss. You never said. As long as you're not going to run off again. Politics Mistress Elena has gathered the other human-born downstairs. Human-born? There are others like me? Yes, ma'am. Four this year. If you'd been at the ceremony yesterday, you would have known. They came through the river after your... absence. Hurry up, please, miss. You're already late. The unkind woman leads her from her room onto the balcony with its cool, crisp air. Rose takes a deep breath and flexes her arm as they walk down the spiral staircase into the now familiar main hallway of the academy. Others are gathered, with a woman pacing before them. Finally, you've arrived, Miss Evermore. Great tree, where's her cloak? Right here, miss, if you please. He offers her a mahogany box with an ornate clasp. Rose looks at him uncertainly before attempting to open the lock. If you require any assistance, I would be more... Uh, I've got it, oh. I've got it. Thank you, Eustace. Okay, look, maybe you should have a try. Eustace says nothing, but opens the box with a flourish. A slate grey cloak is folded inside. Rose pulls it unceremoniously out of the box and shrugs it around her shoulders. Girls fasten their cloak on the left, boys on the right. <sighs> Come on, Miss Evermore, it's not that difficult. Stand still, you've got it all twisted up. There. All tidy. Thanks. What's your name? Dina. 
I'm Rose. Thanks for helping with this. It's probably a whipping offence to get it wrong. I hope not. I strongly suspect that a whipping would be bad for my complexion. (laughs) (laughs) Quiet, please. Settle. Now, though you won't bear your silver wings until graduation, you are expected to represent the Academy with honour and pride. Today we tour the township so that you may get your bearings before beginning your study. Please, pay close attention, and welcome to Fairhaven. The small pack of students are led from the building and into the town square. Rose, remembering crossing it the previous night, swallows nervously. Today, the sun shines and the buildings glitter in raindrops from the previous deluge. Villagers and merchants move out of the way quickly as they tour different squares. A mural. A garden. Isn't it wonderful? Yeah, that's... That's one word for it, I guess. And this is a statue of our previous queen, our longest ruling monarch. Queen Fleur led the country 52 years ago in an age of unprecedented peace. (sighs) Are you as bored as I am? Believe it or not, bored is my preferred state of being here. What do you mean? You've seen a lot more of this place than we have, haven't you? Honestly, I really, really shouldn't say. If we're done gossiping up the back, we'll head to a tavern for lunch. Come on. The two women give Rose a look she cannot decipher before following the other student. Rose trails behind them, her eyes lingering on the statue of the long dead queen, whose virtues Elena had been stolen. As she nears it, her eyes are drawn to the plinth, where white paint has been splashed upon it. She will rise again, what, like a zombie? Oi! I didn't do it. But her stomach sinks as she recognizes the man, the one they'd called Paul, the one who dragged Martin to his punishment. Anger heats under her skin. What have you done? Was this you? No, I was with the student group and they just- And you thought you'd linger to add vandalism to your growing list of crimes, right? You know what we do with truants around here, Miss Evermore? Cut their fingers off? (laughs) Ha! If they're lucky. Excuse me. Why are you manhandling my student? Asking her why she did this to the statue of the Queen. Mom? Rose holds her breath as her teacher examines the plinth. Finally, she straightens and fixes Hall in her gaze. There is no way Miss Evermore could have done this. So why don't you find out who did it instead of questioning my student? You know you don't want to be interfering with my business, Hall. Um, no. No, Mom. Have a good day. Elena waves him off and sees his robe. Don't wander off. I didn't. I trailed behind for just a second. Then don't do that either. Lotharia is a dangerous place, Rose, for non-magi and for human-born. It's not a good sign that you're fighting the rules so early. Keep your head down and your temper in check. Understand? Yes. (sighs) And now I've left four more of you unattended in front of a pub. What could possibly go wrong? But the other human-born are standing dutifully outside a sturdy brick building. They follow Elena inside like ducklings, though Dina and the other girl cast Rose a long look. Inside, they're led upstairs to a private dining room, and pages take their cloaks and gloves. So, you got lost? Not quite. Had a run-in with a guard, but look, all ten fingers accounted for. What's that supposed to mean? I hope you don't expect dining like this to be a regular occurrence, but we'd like you to get settled in and show you what the country of Lotharia has to offer you. I know some of you aren't thrilled to be here, but believe me, others have felt the same in the past. Give it a month or two, and you won't remember your old lives, nor will you want to. Wow, is it just me, or did that get kind of dark? That's Lotharia. Lunch is served as human-born students steal glances at each other across the table. Wine is poured, but Rose pushes her glass away, untouched. Her arm still tingles with the now healing bite marks, and after her running with the men yesterday, she decides a clear head is best. So, you're new? Aren't we all? We're the human-born students, right? 
That's what they call us. Do you think... Do you think they mean to sound it like an insult? Based off everything I've seen here, yes. Dina and Rose wait for the other human-born student to continue, but she goes back to eating her pie without a word. Anyway, do you think we'll ever go back through the river? Rose watches one of the black-armored guards in the corner. He seems uninterested in the conversation, but she doesn't doubt for a second that he's listening to every word. No, I don't think we will go back. Oh. Well, um, did you want to share notes? Stuff we've learnt about the world? Sure. I mean, I know almost nothing about this place, so it's going to be a one-way exchange. (laughs) That's fine. I thought I didn't see you at the speech last night. Yeah, I... Rose thinks about setting Jaren on fire. Got held up with something. Well, we're here to learn alongside the native-born mages. Teresa's been calling them mage bloods. They have a name for us. Seemed only fair. And most of them seem real snobby. Then... The two headmasters, Natalia and Ian. <clears throat> what do they look like? Well, she's, you know, pretty small. White haired, but not old. Smells like flowers. Blue eyes. And Ian? Terrifying. You've met him. Briefly. Is there anything else I should know? Let's see. Uh, headmasters, mage bloods. Ah, oh, magic. That old thing. What magic do you have? There are different kinds. You know, you really should have been at the ceremony yesterday. People keep telling me that. Yeah, so there are different kinds. Most of us just have basic raw power, but others have elemental stuff. Like fire? Yeah, and metal, and clouds, and any other kind of natural shit, I guess. And alongside that, we'll learn theory and practice, the history of Letharia, geography of the entire world, and I think they mentioned something about mages. We ch- we choose our career. Yeah. We're doing career counselling. Pretty much. That's just fucking brilliant. And we also get... Soulmates! Excuse me? They're like your best friend. Someone who shares your life, your thoughts, your soul. Gross. Can we opt out? I asked the exact same thing. If everyone could gather their coats, we're going to head back to the academy. There's another short ceremony required. Reckon we'll ever start class? You know, part of me hopes we don't. Wow! Now that we've been shown Fairhaven, I wonder what it'd be like to run your own colony. Luckily, you can find out. This episode is brought to you by Hooded Horse, publisher of Clan Folk. Clan Folk is a medieval colony sim set in the Scottish Highlands. Harness your environment to survive. Fish, gather, hunt, and farm as you prepare for the harsh winter. Build an inn, trade with other clans, have children and marry them off. Live life and prosper across the generations. There's a free demo available now on Steam. The link is in the episode description, so make sure to check it out. Thank you for listening to episode four of Her Crown of Fire. The sun has leaped over the village in a disappointing sunset as the students leave the tavern with their cloaks wrapped around them. The night chill begins to settle on their skin, and Rose's teeth begin to chatter as they cross the stable yard. Inside, they're led to a small hallway outside the door. Natalia and Eustace are waiting for them. I hope you all enjoyed your outing. Before dinner, we'd like to get you processed so we can proceed to the important part of your schoolings. The other mage students have been waiting for this their entire lives. And they can wait a bit longer. Who are we seeing first, Paige Greatree? I have my list. Let me see here. That would be Miss Dina Bedford, Mom. Yay, wish me luck. Good Good luck. luck. Eustace opens the door for Dina, and she disappears inside with Natalia. The remaining four wait in the darkening hallway, and Rose watches as the other pages in neat academy uniform begin to light the gas lamps. After a while, she realizes Teresa is tapping her foot. What's up with you? I don't know. Antsy? Nervous, I guess. I don't like her being in that room without us. She'll be fine. Don't stress. Yeah, because you haven't seen anything in this world that would give me cause to stress, right? Oh, well... Yeah, that's what I thought. A few moments later, Dina is released. 
holding a page of parchment to her chest. She casts a long look at Rose and Teresa, but stands away from them and says nothing. Rose Evermore, you're next. Gotta love alphabetical roll call. Good luck in there. Cheers. Right back at you. Eustace shows her into the office beyond the door. Inside, a large ornate desk stands in front of a stone wall, with Natalia seated behind it, shuffling papers. In the corner, Ian leans against the fireplace, his features illuminated in a flare flame as Rose nears. Take a seat, Miss Evermore. I'm sure you have many questions, Miss Evermore. Please know you can take them to any of your teachers, especially politics mistress Elena, whom you met today. Sure. Okay. Now, all we're going to do here today is some paperwork and a quick jab with a needle. <laughs> What's the needle for? A little booster of vitamins and immunizations. We've noticed throughout the years that our human-born mages tend to get sick in the first few months of their new life. Rose looks around for a medical team, but it's Ian who sits beside her. She shifts away from him. Your arm, please, Miss Evermore. I promise I'm quite capable of delivering this booster. Oh, you, you promise. Well, all right then. Rose fidgets and counts the pearl buttons on Natalia's blouse as the booster is administered. It is over quickly, and Ian presses clean linen to the site. Done. How does it feel? It hurts. It's fine. Now, to cement your citizenship in Lotharia, your full name, please. Uh, Rose Lucinda Evermore. Date of birth? 3rd of June, 1999. Here you will celebrate your birth on the 12th of Candle Moon. Oh, right, uh, new calendar, I suppose. Correct. Right in the middle of autumn. A fine time to celebrate a birthday. Now, your mother? She exists. Natalia levels a glare at her, but Rose merely continues holding the cloth to her arm and says nothing. How about your father? Well, he doesn't exist. Miss Evermore. It's the truth. I... I can't tell you because I don't know. Rose nearly misses the look Natalia gives Ian. Her face heats. In that case, has anyone in your immediate family disappeared within recent years? I don't... I don't think so. Natalia opens a large, leather-bound book and leaves through the pages, running her finger down the list of names. Sometimes we can reunite human-born mages. There is always a line of magic in each human-born we take. But there are no Evermores in here. Probably on my dad's side then. Not a clue what his last name is. Her thoughts could not be further from her magical lineage. Rose fidgets with her cloak, knowing that the second she finds Tyson, he'll be leaving Lotharia forever. So, a non-magical mother, no father to note, and no immediate magical relative. What an odd little creature you are, Miss Evermore. Here is your new birth certificate. You'll need it for graduation and lodgings in a few years, so keep it safe. The parchment Natalia hands her is embossed with gold foil, with her name and new birth date written in flowing ink. Rose deliberately smudges the E on the end of Evermore. Thanks. Can I go? In a minute. We have just one order of business left to attend to. He sits beside her, with a larger syringe than before. We need to evaluate the quality of your magic, Miss Evermore. And for that, we need your blood. You... you need... you need my blood? Yes. It carries certain genetic markers that will allow us to better guide your education. No, thank you. No. I apologize if I've given you the impression this is a choice, Rose. Why? Apologizing seemed the polite thing to do. Not that. Why do you need my blood? Every student must. It is a condition before beginning your study. Then I won't study. I'll go out and become a baker or something. Rose? Without knowing what your magic is predisposed towards, it would be irresponsible to let you go untrained. As though in response to Ian, flames ignite on Rose's palms and begin to burn up her sleeves towards her shoulders. She is cocooned and warm, as though the fire is trying to protect her from Ian as he advances. A fire mage, is it? Ian. It's all right. Take a breath. Calm yourself. The fire grows to new heights as Rose backs away, 
More threads of embers play over her skin as the ceiling begins to char, and the room glows in golden light as Rose herself sinks further into the heat. Suddenly, Ian lunges for her and catches her in a steady grip. Nat, send for Carrier Bade and tell him to bring smelling salts, please. Smelling salts? Why would you... She never finishes her question. Ian catches her before she hits the floor, her birth certificate fluttering to the carpet. Hello? What's going on? It's all right. Just take a breath. Oh, why can't I see? What's on my head? Just gauze to protect your sight and hearing until the serum wears off. Until the what? What's? You lost control of your magic in the headmaster's office. They took precautions to keep you safe. Oh, I... am. I thought I knocked myself out. Mm. Large displays of magic can do that, yes, but we have procedures in place for young mages who have not yet undergone their training. Poisoning them, right? I didn't say they were good procedures. Right. Oh, I feel like shit. How long does this take to wear off? You'll feel a little woozy and sick for a few hours. Loud noises and strong smells will irritate you. So just stay abed and try to rest. And no more magic. Rose tries to give her a thumbs up, but with the gauze over her eyes, she has no idea where to aim it. Elena gently moves her hands in her direction. For what it's worth, I know what it's like, and I'm sorry. It's fine. Where are the others? Getting their magic ignited with the native-born mages, in the way it's supposed to be done, not by setting the headmaster's office on fire. It's a shame you had to miss another ceremony. Yeah, I'm real caught up about it. Suddenly, there's an earth-shattering clang as the academy bells begin to ring the hour. Rose goes to clasp her ears, but Elena is ready, holding wads of material in place to muffle the sound. Rose's head aches fiercely as warmth begins to trickle from her nose. As the bells fade, a cloth wipes the blood before it can fall. There is fresh gauze on your bedside table. The bells only ring every second hour, but you'll hear them every time. Rose hears her stand to leave, but her footsteps pause at the door. Besides the fire and the poison, how are you settling in? It's only been a few days. Y yes, but I want you to know you can talk to me. Rose doesn't feel like talking. She rolls onto her side, away from Elena's voice. I'll come back to check on you in a few hours. Sure. Whatever. Elena sighs. But when she closes the door behind her, it's gentle. The morning bell tolls and does not set her head ringing. Carefully, Rose sits up in bed, muscles aching as she gets dressed moving slowly and deliberately, lest she summon a fresh migraine. But when one doesn't spear through her temples, she steps out onto the balcony outside, thinking on her days in recovery and what she learned. The Academy isn't just a school, Rose. It's the epicenter of government and trade, where Ian and Natalia conduct all their business with the rest of the country. Yes, in conjunction with the governor and Castor, of course. Castor's the capital, right? That's right. Some of you will head there after you finish your schooling, but no matter. How are you feeling? It has been three days since that conversation. As Rose heads downstairs, she can hear the academy waking around her. She startles a few pages putting out the gas lamps that line the corridors when she reaches the ground floor, and a small figure hurries over to her. Miss, you don't need breakfast brought up this morning? Good morning, Lillian. Uh, thanks, but no, I kind of want to meet everyone and eat with them. Lillian sighs <sighs> and even smiles in Rose's direction. Good timing, miss. Today you've all been given a free pass to wander the town and explore the countryside. Alone? Well enough. You won't be accompanied by a teacher, but the guards will know to watch for you. Oh. Good. You said you were hungry, miss. The other students are this way. Rose follows her through the twisting labyrinth of hallways until they reach the dining room. A large hearth fire burns at one end, and two rows of wooden tables and benches line the flagstones, laden with hungry students. 
Rose peers around for Dina as Lillian guides her to an empty table. As you're able to get around by yourself now, miss, I'll be assigned to other duties. Good luck with your schooling. Thanks, I appreciate... Oh, you're already leaving. Okay. Thanks, Lillian. A serving page brings her a bowl of thin onion soup and a hard crust of bread. Her stomach warbles in anguish as Rose realizes this is the entirety of breakfast. <laughs> Don't worry, you'll get used to it. My mother warned me about the academy food. A dark-haired mage boy sits opposite Rose and receives his own bowl, ignoring the page that hands it to him. Do we always eat like this? There are a lot of people in Lotharia who eat worse. I suggest you finish your bowl, by the way. You'll need your strength. Rose watches him break the crust of bread to use as a spoon and can stand it no longer. Are you my soulmate? I... I don't think so. This was the only seat left in the hall. Yeah, all right. Fair enough. You seem a bit unsure about soulmates. Yeah, well, I have my reservations. <laughs> don't worry about it. You'll be fine. More than fine. What's your name? Uh, Rose. Rose Evermore. Well, it's nice to meet you, Rose. I'm Peter Leon, son of the Lord of Riverdor, up east. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, should I, should I bow, or? <laughs> no. As a mage, you rank equal with me. Uh, you'll discover that soon. Now, finish your bowl and come meet my friends. They eat together quickly, and Peter tows her across the dining hall to two other students. A redhead mage with pale, freckled skin, and a girl with deep brown eyes and flawless, tawny complexion. Orin, Amisha, this is Rose. She thinks the food is God's awful and mistook me for her soulmate. You would have nothing but pity if that were the case. Nice to meet you, Rose. You're a human born, aren't you? Oh, you could tell us so much. I could, but I don't think I should. I don't think the headmasters would like that very much. And you would be correct. Now, away with that dangerous line of questioning. I have- Don't! Tell me you have an itinerary for a casual walk, Orin. Orin has pulled a sheet of folded paper from his pocket and quickly stuffs it away. Of... Of course not. I just... I just have a few places that I'd like us to go on tour. I'm keen. With just one request. We stay away from the town square and the riverfront. Why? I might have... I might have gotten into a small conflict down there. What did you do? Orin, where are we going first? Orin grins at her and takes his soulmate by the arm. They lead the way out of the academy as Rose and Peter trail behind, emerging into a day slightly warmer than usual. Rose removes her cloak and slings it over her arm as Orin discusses the water wheel they're going to see. Passing a cluster of houses, Rose peers down alleys and streets, trying to spot any familiar landmarks that might lead her to Leyland's. But as the group travels farther from the main township, her search remains fruitless, and guilt sinks low in her belly. Are you alright, human born? You're looking very unwell. Was it the soup? <sighs> I won't lie, it didn't help. I've been sick the last couple of days and thought I was getting better, but yeah. So, go on. While the others are distracted, what did you do in town that makes you so unwilling to visit the riverfront? Never you mind, it's done now and no one is on fire anymore, probably. On? On fire. So that statue in the main square is of your queen, right? Rose, did you set a man on fire? It is. Queen Fleur. She died about 50 years ago. But you don't have a monarchy now? Lotharians do things differently than the rest of the world. It's not crazy, Amisha. Don't think I can't hear that tone. They have a magical bloodline and wait on their land-gifted queens. You know, I'm going to side with her on this one. You have a what? Oh, this might take a while, and that soup was far from adequate. Oh, lunch and modern history, anyone? Those are my favourite words. The group finds a small warehouse off the road. The building is almost empty, and the sour-faced woman behind the counter serves them a slab of sagging bread for what seems to rose like quite a lot of Peter's coins. The group takes their bread and sits outside in the sun. Amisha immediately closes her eyes, and relax. <sighs> Used to the heat? I love it. Reminds me of home. You're not from Lotharia, are you? Where's home? The Zolski Islands, to the west. Majors are rare enough in our country that when they're born, they're shipped to Lotharia for proper schooling. Rose suddenly realizes that a new world means new country. That's amazing. Tell me everything. Well, 
The first thing to know is that we have an established dynasty of rulers who've kept our region stable. I was waiting for that. Anyway, yes, we have a magical bloodline of queens who rule the country when required. It's been a while since the last one, so we have Ian, Natalia and the governor of Castor who make up the Council of Three. And the periods of time between queens is nothing but peaceful and amicable. Uh, not always, unfortunately. Regardless, that is the way our ruling system works. And it... it works. Someone had graft a statue. Graft? Uh, graffitied. Drawn on it in paint? Human-born lingo. Ah. Uh. Anyway, they wrote, she will rise again. Do people want the Queen back or something? There's a group of extremists who want the Queen's back. They call themselves the Monarchists. <laughs> Original. I know. They idolise our magical monarchy and disagree with our current ruling faction. They've not done much about it in years, though. So they're hoping a new queen pops up and dethrones the headmasters? To boil it down to basics, yes. Is that likely to happen? Honestly? No. We go centuries out monarchies. It's only been 50 years since the last one. The odds of that happening are extremely small. I'd be very surprised if it did. In the meantime, the Lutherian government struggles to establish trade routes and alliances with neighbouring countries, even those on their doorstep. Because when a new queen, when she rises or whatever, might not honour those treaties, right? Correct. You see the dilemma. Yeah. That is a tricky wicket. You really must teach me these wonderful sayings. The group continues Orin's itinerary until evening. The daytime warmth lapses in the chilled night air, leaving them pink-nosed and shivering as they wander back into Fairhaven proper. It'll be winter soon. Enjoy the days while you can, Amitra and Rose. What do you mean by that? He means snow. And ice. And cold. It snows here. Not as much as up north, but yes. Have you never seen it before? No, never. It's too warm where I come from. Peter immediately begins to question her, but Rose's attention is drawn to a girl moving through the nighttime foot traffic and lamplighters. Her heart quickens. I'll see you guys later. Their hurried goodbyes fade behind her as she chases Layla through the alleys. She's quicker, having grown up in this labyrinth of cobbles and close houses. Layla! Her shout causes several villagers to look at her in alarm, but the girl she is chasing halts and addresses Rose over her shoulder. I don't want to talk to you. What happened wasn't my fault. But that doesn't mean I have to like seeing you. Rose falters for a moment, the hurt sinking in. Then she pushes forward and moves around Layla to look her in the eyes. All I want to know is what happened to Tyson. Your now Magi friend. Yes, my best friend. <sighs> He's in Fairhaven. He found some work with a local smith. Oh, thank God. I'll guess you'll want his address. Please. Come here. She tucks the basket she's carrying into the crook of her elbow, tugging Rose's glove from her hand. The cold evening air bites, but Rose ignores it as Layla grips her wrist and draws a reed from the messy bun at the nape of her neck. She begins to draw a tiny map in thin ink on Rose's palm, her head bowed in concentration, strands of her hair tickling Rose's nose. You smell like flowers. I'm sorry? Thank you for the map. Layla straightens, replacing the cap on her pen. The two look at each other for a moment in the dim lamplight, and then Layla turns to leave. Hey, I'm... I'm really sorry for what happened to your father. It was never going to work. I guess desperation does funny things to people. She turns away with a bitter smile and walks off as a chilled wind ruffles Rose's cloak. She watches the hem of Layla's skirts until she turns a corner, then jumps as the academy bells toll across the town. She looks at her hand, contemplating the map that will lead her to Tyson. Rose takes a hesitant step away from the academy when a hand clamps down on her shoulder. Well, if it isn't my little artist. I was just heading inside, sir. Didn't seem that way. Looked like you were heading out into the town, despite the curfew being in effect. I... I didn't know. Nah, you wouldn't, would ya? I know you dirtied that statue. You had paint on your fingertips. Yes, because I touched it. A likely story. Come on, fess up now. There's no teacher to interfere on your behalf now, human born. I can't admit to anything because I didn't do anything. 
I've committed no crime, not then and not now. You know, I wasn't on the dockside patrol on your first day here, but I heard about your excursion nevertheless. Seems the dockmen have developed a nasty habit of catching fire since you've arrived. Human. Born. Keep that fire in check, Miss Evermore. I wouldn't want to report to the headmasters about that little incident. Yeah, I'm sure you'd really hate that. Good night, sir. It's Hall. Sergeant... Hall. Good night, Sergeant Hall. Rose turns and heads for the castle steps, disappearing beneath the eaves, with the man watching her every move. Stop looking at your schedule. They'll change it after the first day anyway. They might change yours. I'll be happy going to these for as long as they'll let me. <sighs> Hand it over. Beginner theory. Starter casting. Rose, you won't be in these classes longer than a week. Five silver says you get bumped up to my level next week. Joke's on you. I don't have any money. Deal. They arrive at their first class of the morning as their other classmates do. Peter immediately strains ahead and Rose gives him a little push. Go with your kind then. Get your real classes. Peter gives her a bright smile and heads eagerly into the room. Oh, leave him. The other mages are excited to be here. The classroom is crowded by the time they find a place to sit. Three arched windows show the grounds far below, letting in shafts of cold, gray light as the wintry weather continues to bluster outside. Exposed wooden beams cross the ceiling, from which two brass candle holders swing with stunted candles. The bang of books on the desk jolts Rose's attention to the front of the room. Sit down, hurry up. My name is History Master Jutias. There is a flurry of movement as the students hasten to their chairs. Now, before we get started with actual work, you must choose a subject to major in. Though you'll receive basic tutelage in all of them, your later years will be focused on your major. Once you leave the academy, certain careers have higher institutions you will attend. Paige Myler is handing out your options. A slip of parchment is placed on Rose and Dina's desk. You have five minutes. Don't dawdle. But, Mr. Jatias, the human-born just got here. Shouldn't they... What? Get special treatment? Some consideration? No. The headmasters say they are to be treated as the rest of you. There is panic silence as the teacher turns over a large hourglass on his desk. Rose clutches at her sheet of parchment and examines the 15 options closely. Beside her, Dina is numbering the lines and muttering to herself. Rose glances up, accidentally catching the teacher's eye. Time's almost up. If you don't choose, one will be assigned to you. Rose wishes she sat next to Peter, who has already marked his preference and is handing his form back. Panicking, Rose jabs her pen at an option and holds up her sheet as the teacher passes. He quirks an eyebrow and, to her surprise, tries to hand the page back. Runes? You can choose again if you want. No, it's fine. That's the one I meant to pick. You'll be the first in years. Have fun with your new... mentor. Some of the mage blood students snicker. Rose's cheeks heat. I'm actually really interested in the subject. I find them fascinating, and I can't wait to start class. All right, then. He moves along to the next student as Rose leans into Dina. What the hell are runes? What the shit is horticulture? Oren was right. We should have had more time to be coached on these. It is just unfair. At least we still have all our fingers. Why do you keep mentioning fingers? The class is released a short while later, with the human-borns peeling off from the others to be taught basic theory that bores Rose half to sleep. Instead, she copies the smudged map from her hand into the back of her notebook, and when they're led outside the castle, the cold, fresh air is a welcome refreshment. There's going to be a frost tonight. First no more like. A small argument breaks out between the two, and Rose stops listening halfway through enjoying being outside in the field with the trees and the sun. She spies the other human-born students, Dina, Yasmin, and Teresa, and goes to wave until Peter speaks again. What about you, Phoenix? Snow? Ice? We feel just like home, eh? Stop it. Leave him alone, Peter. Rose watches a tall, mage-blood boy with a solemn face nod in their direction and then walk on. Who's that? He's from the north. Welcome back. It's been so long since I've seen you all. Yes, that's right. I'm responsible for your physical fitness as well. Go change. I'm not having you run around in your uniforms and losing your cloaks. I'll never hear the end of it from Elena. 
Over here, students, and be careful. Blood is awful to get out of this fabric. Oh, good. Thanks for the heads up, Eustace. You are welcome, Miss Evermore. Change rooms are over there. Now, let's get an idea of your physical fitness level. We're going to start with laps. Uh, laps of what? Jatias gestures across the field. Pages are standing at different distances as human markers. Eustace is their closest page and waves. How many laps? Until you fall over. Go! Oh, oh shit. No. The group takes off at different paces. Rose and Yasmin quickly become the stragglers, stumbling along together in solidarity. Crisp air sears Rose's lungs and a stitch spears through her side as she slows. Peering ahead, she takes stock of the leaders noting most of the magebloods are leading, but Teresa keeps pace with them easily. Come on, faster, you two. You've been lapped twice. When they're a fair distance from their teacher, both stagger to a halt. <sighs> oh my god, oh my god. <sighs> I'm going to puke. <sighs> Rose slumps to her knees and lies face down in the grass. Feet rumble past the pair, but neither of them pay any attention. <sighs> If you're gonna puke, do it over there. Not here. Uh, uh, I hate this, Rose. No one said anything about running. Yeah, I would have opted out of this whole magic thing if I'd known. Me too, honestly. When they've caught their breath, they admit defeat and walk back to History Master Jatias, keeping a safe distance from their teacher. Seated together in the grass, they watched the remaining pack get whittled down until only Peter and the northerner, Phoenix, remain. The class watches the two for the better part of half an hour until Peter eventually returns to the group. He keeps his distance from his friends and stands to the side, arms folded over his heaving chest. Well done, northerner. Top of the class already. For your prize, you get to choose your weapon first. Jealousy rolls off the class and the brooding Peter, as the weapons card is wheeled out by the pages. Phoenix hesitates, as though waiting for a cruel joke to be played. But when no one stops him, he examines the selection of swords, axes, and shields. Rose watches as, after a few moments' consideration, he chooses a long sword in a dark leather scabbard. He examines the silver trimmings, then draws the sword confidently. That's a good choice, boy. A solid blade from a good smith. There's no response as the younger man takes the sword in both hands. Peter glowers, and Rose burns with more questions, but they die in her throat as the northerner turns back to them. He's looking at the sword he's chosen. Not proudly, but as someone who's used one before. When Rose asked an academy page for directions to her first runes lesson, their refusal to take her there is surprising, considering Eustace's constant willingness to be everywhere all at once. Instead, the page points her towards a stairwell that she follows deep into the castle. The gas lamps this far down are tinted green, their light dim and meager against the oppressive weight of the academy above. Rose follows the hallway with quickening steps, spooked by the silence of the chilly labyrinth. Finally, a wooden door blocks her path. She knocks frantically. Enter. Uh, hello. I was looking for the runes master. Hmm. So you're my student. Inside, the small office is lined with bookshelves with thick books whose pages face outwards. A branch of candles lights one corner and a heavy, parchment-covered desk. Behind it, sits a man with a mane of ash-blonde hair. He tucks a bottle out of sight as she enters. Student singular? Just one? I usually only get one. And unless your name is Rose Elmore, we're waiting on someone else. Yeah, no, that is definitely me. Good. Sit down. What do you know about runes? Not much. Right then. Starting from basics, I guess. Rose sits and pulls out a fresh notebook from her bag. The teacher immediately takes it from her. 
Hey! Use this one instead. Why? What are these shapes? Those are runes. Oh, cool. What for? That notebook is where you'll draw your own runes. At the end of the semester, the book will be destroyed to prevent any wily magics occurring. But until then, those designs will stop anything you draw from activating. Mint. Sounds good. You're human-born, aren't you? Yeah. Why? I've no clue why you just called that a herb. This has happened a few more times since her walk with Peter and the others. Including once where Peter was mortified by her invoking an oath while agreeing with someone. Rose had learned quickly that sworn oaths in Lotharia are taken very seriously. You don't normally get a human-born student? I don't normally get a student. Maybe they couldn't find the class. Rose thinks she sees the hint of a smile, but it's gone as he jerks his chin toward her new notebook. What are you doing? Oh, I just copied one of the runes from the top. Hmm. Good enough. For a first go. You know, I wasn't really trying. Do it again. In one movement this time. Rose draws the rune three times in silence, before finally looking up. Um, sir? You haven't told me how to address you. Arno. Just Arno. Master Arno, if you want to be proper about it. Do you only teach runes, Master Arno? It's my area of expertise. I'm one of two living rune masters in Lutheria. He returns to his work. Rose peers over the desk, spying the rows of tiny, perfect shapes that he draws with ease. What are you doing? Designing. A damn near Mornington is weakening, and I've been commissioned to fix it. With runes? In the hands of a master, runes are the most powerful form of magic. Arno lays down his pen and opens a drawer on the other side of his desk. He reappears with a solid slab of granite that clunks against the wood, and, with Rose watching silently, begins to daub shapes onto the stone from a small jar of white paint. A rumbling reaches the lowest range of her hearing, as the candles burning on every surface begin to jitter. The runes on the stone flare golden, and the granite rots away from the edges until it collapses into dust, which Arno sweeps onto the floor. What the shit was that? I resealed some fissures under the south wing. I've been meaning to do it for a while, but you reminded me. Got to do it every half year. You painted pictures onto a rock and, I'm sorry, resealed like cave fissures? In rock and stone? Yes. That can't be all there is to it. He reaches down and produces another slab of granite. This one is slid across the desk to Rose. Look at that, human born. And tell me what you see. Rose sees a big chunk of stone. I don't know. I guess it's kind of pretty. If you're into rocks. It's pretty. Is that all? I'm guessing no from your tone. I mean, it's super smooth and shiny, but... Wait, isn't granite, like, really hard to mine? How'd they cut this and polish it? This particular piece took several weeks in a workshop. Hundreds of non-magi hours were sunk into this pretty rock. My work relies on non-magi craftsmanship. The more hours and effort involved in creating a material, the more energy that the runes drawn, carved, or painted on it can pull from. You have to work with the non-magi. Don't tell me that lot upstairs have gotten into your head already. No, but I got some funny looks when I picked runes as my major. A lot of them up there don't like me. And that's all I'll say on that topic evermore. So, now you've seen what runes are capable of, I will teach you if you want to learn. I do. Master and student work together for the next few hours. Rose's hand cramps around her pen as she traces a single rune over and over again. Arno returns to his own designs, but fades into Rose's background as she begins to dissect and correct her own drawing. Finally, He breaks the silence. Pen down, Nevermore. It's time to try it for real. My hand hurts. That goes away. Take this. A candle? What does this rune even do? You'll see. Rose seats the candle in her hand and takes a deep breath. The candle is simple white wax, the surface begging to be marked. Rose accepts the short knife her master hands her, envisioning the quick, clean cuts she'll carve. 
Trained by the repetition of the past few hours, her fingers work confidently, and when the wick bursts into flame, she releases a breath that nearly blows it out. It means burn. You've done your first rune work, Evermore. Well done. Rose sits with the burning candle in hand, a grin on her face. Only later does she realize she hasn't thought of Tyson in hours. Okay, so you've got the bottle. Yep. You want to take three drops of that every hour, then make sure you drink some water. Keep taking the drops if you need to. The batch is pretty weak, I think. This is my first one. Do you have any idea how handy it is that you chose healing as your major? I love it already. Carrie Bade is a really good teacher, Rose. I hope you get to meet him. Rose and Dina stand in a quiet, half-lit hallway. Their cloaks wrap tightly around them against the night chill. Rose carries a small bottle of blue liquid, which she's told Dina is for her headache. But really, she has more important plans for her friend's medicine. I'd like to meet him, just not because I have to be carried into hospital or anything. Don't speak too soon. We have more sword class this week. Oh, and don't make that face. You're not even the worst at it. A shining endorsement if I've ever heard one. (laughs) Thanks again for this. I'm going to go to bed. See you tomorrow. Rose watches her friend walk down the hall and turn a corner, then slips out a side door and into the courtyard. By arrangement, Thompson, the stable boy, has left the smaller gate unlocked for her and, to her knowledge and relief, has not consumed the small bottle of liquid she gifted him last time. Armed with better knowledge of the town, it takes her less than an hour to find Layla's house along the street. A light glows in one window, and she hurries under the eaves. It's me. Go away, Rose. I have something for your father. To help. After what seems an age, the door is unlocked and open for her. A single candle lights the main room, with Markin laid out across the bench beside the unlit cooking fire. Are you happy now? I never asked for this. Rose approaches a stricken man and kneels beside the bench. How's he doing? I don't know. When we saw what they'd done to him at the academy, at, at first we were relieved. They usually take more. I think they didn't because he works hard and talks little. And now he's not doing either. Can I look at him? Are you a healer? No, but my friend is. She gave me this. Layla takes the bottle from Rose and nods as she is instructed in its use. Rose lights a small flame on her thumbnail, examining the hand and arm which lost the finger. Bright red streaks claw up the man's arm, and Rose lets the fire die out. It's poisoned, isn't it? Once he developed those marks and a fever, I knew. You have to take him somewhere, Layla. This needs treatment. Something way stronger than that headache cure. We don't have anywhere to go. The clinic shut down because no one could afford it, and the carrier moved on. Carrier Bear at the academy could tend to us, but the headmasters don't let him. Of course, but look, he'll help. He's my friend's teacher, and she says he's really nice. I'll speak to him on your behalf and- Just stop, Rose. If the Academy finds out you came here again, a finger is the least of our worries. <laughs> do, you, do you know why my father was fishing at the river for students that day? No. I never asked. He hoped you'd take me on as your handmaid. A lot of wealthy students bring their own staff to the Academy with them, but we don't have any connections to the nobles. So, we tried for the next best thing. You. But on the day the students arrived, I got cold feet. I told them not to do it, that it was too risky to involve the academy in our lives. He did it anyway, and paid in blood. I guess that's why you weren't so thrilled to see us. No. And to find out your friend was not Magi? It was like a cruel joke the gods had played on us. I... I know what you're going to offer, Rose. Don't. I won't work for you, not under their roof, not for all the gold in the headmaster's pockets. Now, you'd better go. Don't worry about my father. I'll tend to him. If there's anything I can do to help... I will make sure you never heard of it. Now go. Rose leaves the broken man and his grieving daughter, her chest rising and falling as she closes the door gently. Then, her eyes settle into the night, and she pulls a map from her pocket. She traces the route with her finger and begins to run down the streets, guided by memory 
and ink until she slides to a stop outside of the building. In the small loft above, flickering golden light glows through wooden slats of the window shutters. Tyson! There is no response. Rose seizes a piece of old charcoal from the ground and throws it at the closed shutters, leaving sooty streaks on her hands. The clack of the window unfastening sets her heart pounding. I've told you, kids. If you don't- Hey, long time no see. Holy shit. He withdraws back into the loft, and Rose watches his shadow flicker across the room. A few seconds later, the small side door of the shop is wrenched open, and Tyson sweeps her into a massive hug. I thought you'd left me here. Never. Never, ever. He puts her down and, with a furtive glance around the street, ushers her inside. Upstairs, he quickly kicks a basket of clothes under the bed and fastens the window shutters. Rose sits on the bed as he settles beside the struggling fire in the small hearth. Well, I'll start, shall I? Oh, man. Well, that girl bailed me out the back door and into the streets. Had a hell of a time doing it, too. I kept trying to go back. She was stubborn as all hell. Reminded me of someone. Yeah, all right. Calm down. <laughs> anyway, she set me up with some other clothes. Lost my favorite shirt and jeans, by the way. She burned the lot in a barrel. Then she gave me some money, said I looked like I could lift heavy things, and steered me here. I reckon she got me deliberately lost because I could not find my way back. This place is a bit of a maze. Yeah, well, I've learned it now. I wandered around the entire district and spoke to every journeyman I could find. Eventually, one of them knew Craig was looking for a workshop assistant, so I rocked up on his doorstep. He took one look at me and had me hauling coal for the forge. Then I settled in to wait for you to show up. Saw Layla a few times, too. Oh. Yeah, I didn't know anyone except Craig, so it was nice of her to come check on me. She, uh, she brought me something. Hey, whoa, whoa. Too much information. Nothing like that, you jerk. She taught me to knit. He reaches beneath a chair he's sitting in and pulls out a bag full of yarn. Oh my god. What are you making? Just a shitty little hat. Ah, look. She said not to try anything too complicated first go. Here, you can hold it. It's cute. Won't fit your fat head, though. Well, I was making it for you, but if you're going to be a dick about it... Hey, whoa, calm down now. I didn't say I didn't like it. You can have it in a few weeks. I'm learning to do the fluffy ball thing on top. Anyway, she seemed a bit distracted. Asked a couple times if you'd come to visit me. You realize I have to sneak out of the academy, right? You think the guards are only on the streets? Yeah. What's it like in there? Is it all fancy and shit? It's big and lonely. My friend has to come and collect me every morning so I can find my glasses. But I don't have to pay for lodging or food, so that's a positive, I guess. Plus, you know, you're actually meant to be here. Are you okay? No? I don't know, it's just... Ugh. I watch the guards patrol the streets every night, and I feel like a prisoner in the rooms I pay lodging for. I'm always hungry, I burn myself in the forge at least once a day, I, I get cold every night, and I have nothing to do but knit if it gets dark early. Ah. <sighs> Mainly, I'm terrified what will happen when they find out I'm human-born. Silence falls between the two, as new flames curl around the damp wood in the hearth, fresh and bright. What can I do? You can find a way to get us home. A way... a way home? Yeah. I can't stay here, Rose. Neither can you. No, of... no, of course not. All right. I'll... I'll get us home. You promise? Yes. Oh, well. We're not going by the river. We're not? I... I tried it my first night alone. Stood in it, waist deep, and dunked my head under. Didn't feel anything like when we were brought here. You tried to leave without me? What else was I meant to do, Rose? For all I knew, this is where you're meant to be. Maybe this is where you want to be. I saw fire come to you, sit in your hand, climb up your arms. That shit doesn't happen back at home, Rose. It happens here. You don't get to decide where I belong. I know. I'm sorry. I was scared. To be honest, doing that, trying to go back home without you, it's haunted me since day one. I'm... 
I'm sorry too. I, the idea of being here without you, that just kind of stuck with me. Whatever we do, we do as a team. Agreed. Now, you better get home before it starts getting light. There'll be a change of guard just before midnight. You should be able to get back in. You know, one thing I've gotten pretty good at is sneaking around. I'll be alright. I'll see you soon, though. Yeah. Keep your head down. Wouldn't want you to lose it. <sighs> You're a jerk. Come here. They hug goodbye, and then Rose heads out into the frosty streets. She's dreaming of her warm bed and a fire when she sneaks back through the side gate Thompson left open for her. Inside the castle, the academy slumbers with only the hiss of the gas lamps to mask her footsteps. A nice night for a walk, Miss Evermore. Rose's blood turns to ice as the headmaster rises from where he'd been waiting on the stairs. She freezes on the spot, her mind working furiously as she pulls her cloak up to her neck. Good evening, Master Ian. It's a bit chilly out there, but I like the quiet. I just wanted to clear my head. But of course. These past few weeks have been drying for the human born. I know. Rose scratches at her neck under the cloak as he approaches. She holds it in place, as though trying to hide something. Some students have been fitting in better than others, though. With the uh, curriculum and their fellow students. Lower your cloak, please. Rose hesitates a moment then reveals the red spot on her neck and looks down. Ian steps away. I must ask that you stay in the academy after the evening bells toll from now on. I won't ask you for his name, but you should know the punishment is quite severe for a mage and non-magi to be caught in any kind of friendship or tryst. There's a reason we discourage relationships between different types of blood. Yes, sir. Understood. May I go up? You may. Get some sleep. You have class tomorrow. A lot of lessons to be learned, I'm sure. I think I'm getting the hang of them. Good night, Headmaster Ian. Rain beats down outside, soaking the grounds of the academy and the town beyond. Rose watches at a window, her thoughts centered on Tyson. As the weather grows colder, she finds herself worrying about his flat. Is it waterproof? Will it leak in the rain? Will he have enough firewood for the winter? Are you alright? You seem pensive today. Rose turns to face her friend, who adjusts the strap across her chest and resettles the long, canvas map tube on her back. I'm alright. Still getting used to cartography? Yes, but... I love it. We're mapping the interior of the academy. My teacher, Master Sovereign, is interesting. I don't think my mother would like her. Why do you seem pleased by that prospect? I love my mother, but she can be difficult. Ugh, tell me about it. What were you thinking? Looking out into the rain? I'm just a little homesick, is all. I know how you feel. I miss the islands. Together. Both women begin to walk towards the library. The hallways are empty, with the students tucked up in cozy places for the cold day, or out braving the deluge to explore the town. Rose and Amisha pass a descending staircase and slow their steps as both peer into the darkness. That place down there, the chamber, it worries me. You were taken to the cavern. I think we all were, but it wasn't a cavern for me. They halt at the first step that disappears into the yawning dark. A stale breeze sweeps up from underground, and though they're alone, voices mutter past their ears from the inverted tower. So, if not a cave for you, what was it? An island in the sea. Rose looks to her, waiting for her to elaborate. But Amisha readjusts the map tube again. Come on, Peter and Oren are waiting for us. Further down the hall, the academy doors are swung wide. Inside, a polished wooden desk with library pages scribbling behind it stands guard against the tall rows of mahogany shelves. The women move through the stacks to the back of the library, where Peter and Oren are waiting against the rain-spattered windows. Oh, finally, they arrive. We thought you two weren't coming. How is runes? I like it. I think I'll stick with it. 
And what do you think of your mentor? Arno seems like a great teacher. What about your major? War magic, though superior discipline, <laughs> obviously. Fighting and strategy and battle tactics. I thought all you could do was sharpen the blades of daggers. <laughs> um, yes, but it's not all I can do. It's just what we've done so far. I can strengthen swords, protect their wielder. War magic is actually a varied element of, of different disciplines. Not again, please. I can't hear it all again, Peter. All right, fine. Tell them about your major, weather boy. Orin quirks a grin at the two watching, then runs his finger along the glass. The rain on the other side of the windows follows the path, bending unnaturally against the flow of the rivulet. That is weather magic. He's lying. He gave me a half-hour lecture on bloody clouds before. Oh, I can't believe we missed it. Oh, God, that was sincere, wasn't it? Um, maybe for her, I'm good. Oren, no offence. It's all right. What are you reading today, Rose? Um, the rivers and inlets of southern Lotharia. And I thought I was the cartography student. <laughs> I love runes, but I just needed a break from them, you know? I still can't believe you're continuing with that subject. Why not? I'm good at it. Well, it's just drawn little pictures of musty objects, right? You could be doing longsword training with us. I know you'd enjoy that. I do. It's just... I enjoy runes more. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yes, there is. Thank you, Amisha. Together, the group studies in comfortable silence, sheltered from the rainstorm in the quiet library. As the others talk quietly amongst themselves, Rose closes her book on Lotharian rivers, finding nothing to help her effort to escape. The next morning, the students gather for breakfast in the dining hall. Thick smoke wafts from the hearth fire, and Rose coughs as she makes her way over to her friends. <coughs> What's with all the smoke this morning? They're burning greenwood. It's all the pages could bring in for us this morning. Which means it'll be bad in the township. Why? The Academy has a reservation of the best resources. If we have greenwood, then they have nothing. They'll probably bar more people from the forest to make sure we have meat over the winter. Huh. Hence the shitty soup today. So, what's everyone else supposed to do? Well, they'll steal it from the woods anyway. Or they'll rug up. They might start up the communal hall again and pull their resources, but it's not much. Ooh, mail time. A page stops by, handing him a letter and flicking her dark red hair over her shoulder. Rose watches as Peter opens his mail and scans the contents. What do you plan to do with your day off? Not sure. Might read for a bit. Might go for a walk. Books? Again? Rose, you need a rest. I don't. Just, as I said, I really like it. You have a book in your bag right now, don't you? No. Liar. Peter hooks his foot around the strap of her bag and yanks it towards him as Rose stuffs her boot into it to stop him. She is half pulled under the table as Peter lifts it onto his lap. Five times runes saved the world. <laughs> it's never happened. Basic runes to change your life. Rose, you need a hobby. And a life. I have one. It's runes. Give me my bag. Good morning, you two. I see breakfast is peaceful today. He stole my books. She's going to read on her day off. Can you believe it? I approve. Aaron and I are walking to Saints Crossing today, if you'd like to join us. Today? It's too cold to swim. But not for apple picking. The trees will be in fruit soon, and I've heard the small tart ones are actually the sweetest. That's no way to talk about Rose. She's literally right there. <laughs> <laughs> you want to wear your soup, mage boy? Keep talking. Leave her alone, Peter. Rose, would you like to come with us? I'll walk between you and Peter. Thank you, but no, I'm, I'm going to get some reading done. Ugh, yawn. Rose repacks her bags as the others get up to leave. Her eyes lingering on the departing group as indecision holds her in place. Then, with a slight sigh, she sets off into Fairhaven. This time, she finds her way to the shop easily, dodging mules and carts, workmen and flustered apprentices, Rose threads amongst the craft district until she spots the familiar building, the main door now wide open to the street. Tyson stands just inside, watching two large men argue over a wooden cart of coal. Rose! More than one delivery girl who had been lingering near the entrance suddenly scatters, 
throwing Rose a dark look as Tyson wraps his arm around her shoulders. Come meet Craig. Yeah, but this is good charcoal. Solid lumber burned down in a hot clay. You are arguing for the sake of nothing again, Craig. Three good pieces in a barrel full of shit. The smith crushes some of the charcoal in his fist and splinters of unburnt wood bounce off the muddy ground. The exact same trick you tried last time, Garen. Don't come by my shop again. The trader heaves the handles of his barrel and scurries away, as the smith shows Tyson the coal. All this trick in a charcoal trader's handbook. A few pieces from a good burn scattered in a barrel full of crap. Be wary. We need good charcoal to burn hot, and this won't even fire pottery. <sighs> I'll make sure to tell the guild Garen is trading again. Good idea, sir. Oh, uh, this is my friend, Rose. The smith looks down at her and sighs again. <sighs> well, I guess I'm not very lucky. Into the shop, boy. He sweeps the pair into the shop, now familiar to Rose as she stands near the forge. Craig closes the door, shutting out the icy gray light of the day. You're a mage. He knows? Yes, sir. He considers for a moment, running a wide hand over his jaw. Then he grunts and clips Tyson in the ear. Idiot! You know what the penalty is for dating mage girls. I told you on your first day. Ah, I'm not dating her, sir. She's my friend. That's how they all start. You two just stay out of the guard's sight, or I'll be held to pay. Probably my hell, as you're under my care, Tyson Wells. So don't get caught. Yes, sir. And you, girl, you're lucky I believe in the face. Treat my shop and my boy well. Craig looks at the two for a moment, as though he has more to say. Then he shakes his head and disappears through the side door and onto the street. Of all the shops, of all the shops you could have taken work at, it's his. You've met before. Once, when I was out looking for you. I like him. He has this way of seeing through people. Tyson. Marika, the baker's wife up the street. She says it's because he's from the north and- You told him. Tyson, damn it. You know how dangerous that is. The fire flares as Rose clenches her fists. But Tyson just sighs and hangs the hammer he was holding in the tool rack. Calm down evermore. He knew already. Took one glance at me and said I looked like a rounding hammer when he wanted a fuller. I study magic, Tyson, not tools. Different hammers for different jobs. Your boss knows you're human-born non-magi. Yes. And he was okay with this. You heard what he said about the fates. He said he'd been waiting for a test like me. That he'd train me and house me for as long as he needed to. No. I, I don't buy it. I, I don't trust it. And now, someone in this world knows that you're not meant to be here. Do you know how dangerous that is? Hey, it's going to be all right. Come here. The two rest in an easy embrace before another voice scares ten years off both of them. I knew it! I told you she was banging someone. Peter Leon, what have I told you about using that word? Did I? Oh, did I not use it right? For the first time since Rose has taught it to him, he has. So, I'm guessing these are your friends. That's a strong word for it. Get that shit-eating grin off your face, Leon. You adore me evermore. Who knows how dull your pathetic life would be without me. I am Peter Leon, son of the Lord of Rivador. To Rose's surprise, Tyson bows deeply in a practiced move. My lord. And your name? Tyson Wells, my lord. Apprentice to Craig Lefalen, fourth master of the Blacksmith Guild of the Southern Lotharian region. Rose gives him a look, which he avoids neatly. She clears her throat as Orin and Amisha step forward. Allow me to introduce Lady Amisha Neela from the Zolski Empire. Here to study under the esteemed tutelage of our headmasters. My lady. And I'm Arrhenius Thoreau, first son of the House Thoreau. Call me Orin. So, you're Rose's non-magi friend? That I am, Master uh, Orin. Peter, you owe me five gold. Just like to point out this because their friend doesn't mean they're not bang romantically involved. So, anyway, you're a smith. Just an apprentice, miss. Have you been at it long? Only since the 4th of Dawn Harbour, my lady. Are you enjoying it? Very much, my lady. May I show you some of my work? He gestures to his workbench, but doesn't dare touch her as they approach it. Rose watches them go, then peers at her boots. Her heart races in her chest 
as Peter and Orin look around the shop. These are wonderful. So beautiful and simple. Peter opens his mouth. Don't you dare. The three close in on the workbench, and Rose realizes that what she had thought were scraps of metal are actually the outlines of small animals. She picks up the shape of a bird, holding it carefully. You made all of them? I did, yes. Craig likes that I've taken interest in artisan blacksmithing. You're very talented. Thank you, my lady. I use them for practice after we close the shop at night. You may have that one, if you like. Thank you. It looks like a fish from back home, called Lapuni. Which is moonfish in basic. We don't all speak Zolskanese as well as you do. It's like you sense the opportunities to be a condescending prick. We must all have our gifts evermore. We'd better get going to the crossing. I promised Dina we'd bring her some apples. Oh, you're leaving. Maybe I should go with you. I think you're in capable hands here. And Rose? We won't say a word to the headmasters. Thank you. All of you. I'll see you back at the academy tonight. You have a lot of friends already. Don't have to sound so surprised. Yet here we are. I'm serious, Rose. You've never been one for making friends so easily. How long did it take you to talk to me? About four weeks of primary school. You've been here for less time than that. You've got three friends. Three! I can count. I do know how many there are. I'm proud of you. I mean, I know we're leaving, so they don't really count. But I'm still proud of you. Oh, right. Yeah, um... <clears throat> hey, what's the 4th of Dawn Harbor? It's the month that we're in. The month when term starts and most elections are held. You don't know that? The new calendar. <laughs> I totally forgot. Craig and I decided on it as my start date. So he's been... Mentoring you? I think mentoring is too nice of a word for what I've been through. You make him sound so wonderful, though. I understand him. I know where he's from, which is why I don't mind when he snaps at me or expects me to understand something after barely a sentence. The North. Rose, it's a different place from here. What do you know about it? Not much. The people from there, they're bred differently. They think differently. They're made of something else. I've never met anyone as strong as Craig. You know, I've seen him lift anvils and bend red hot iron bars with his hands. He can burn himself and not even notice, let alone react. He never shows an ounce of emotion. Well, not until you walk through the door today. Sometimes, I genuinely think he'd kill someone and just never say a word. So when he told me he'd hire me, but I had to learn everything first to make my story believable, I trusted him. When he packed me onto a wagon leaving for Norrisville early morning in the freezing rain, I rode that damn thing for four hours north so I could learn everything about the place. Now, when people ask me where I'm from, I can answer confidently. I won't be discovered here, Rose, because of him. He's built for something other than the comfortable life we have in the South. And as long as we're here, I need to be too. At breakfast the next morning, Rose gets her first proper taste of why the Northerners are hated. A small contingent of armored soldiers from Castor arrive in the hall as the students eat. Conversation dies across the room as Natalia stands in the doorway, observing the captain who walks towards a young woman sitting alone. She begins to cry, as the man's murmured words echo across the silent hall. Another raid? Where? I know her. Anarchy of Long Rock. Her brother, Alan, was organising the fighting groups in the region. Long Rock? Are you sure? Our families are friendly. They stay with us every summer. Is Long Rock close to here or something? Long Rock is the only stronghold between Riverdor and the Orthanbrellian border. Riverdor? Where my family and estate resides. I know. I just didn't realize. The girl, Anna Key, is crying softly as those around her look on in sympathy. The captain rests a hand on her shoulder, but removes it quickly as Natalia speaks. To class, please, everyone. Anna Key, come with me. They don't like us talking about it. Don't let any of the teachers hear you mention it. 
So why did they tell her in front of everyone? It's customary for immediate family members to know within 48 hours of a death. A messenger would have ridden hard during the night to bring Natalia this news, and she was bound to deliver it to anarchy within the time limit. Not even the headmasters can defy the old laws. Classes continue for the day, but worried whispers circle when the teachers are out of earshot. Jatias turns a deaf ear to it in his class, but most of the students merely sit together, drawing comfort from each other's presence. Later, the group holds up in the library to study and have a band conversation. Oren sits against his soulmate's legs, and Amisha winds his hair into small coils. Did you know him well? I guess. He was older than me. Came with Anarchy and her parents to our estate every summer to help with the harvest. We used to swim in the lake together, so... Yes, I knew him well. What will happen to her? To Anarchy? They'll let her go home, right? They're not letting her return for the funeral. What? They say it's too dangerous to go that close to the border. And there's no laws to say they have to let her go. So they won't. Silence lapses over them. Tucked in a small nook of the library, all four look at each other in the reflection of the tall, darkened windows. Long Rock will be lost in the next fortnight or so. When it is, the headmasters may decide that its strategic value is worth a half thousand lives or so it'll cost to bring it back under southern rule. If not, the North just gained itself a very valuable stronghold and the headmasters still won't accept this as anything other than border skirmishes. That's a lot to assume after the death of one man. I knew Alan of Long Rock almost as well as Orin. He was a master of war magic and strategy. I know which group of fighters he led, and I know that they, not the headmasters, not the war counts who and Gower, are, were, our best line of defense against Orthondrell. If Alan's dead, so is the entire Legion, and Longrock will fall. Peter looks away and rubs his jaw. Rose reaches out and takes his hand. Their fingers intertwine, and her breathing steadies as Peter leans back toward her. Peter, what happens to Riverdor now? What happens to your family? I don't... I don't know, Rose. A few minutes later, the group leaves the library. Orin and Amisha speak quietly, but Rose and Peter say nothing as they gather their books and study materials, still hand in hand. As they go to leave, Amisha's voice stops them. We don't know what's coming, but with the raid on Long Rock and all you've told us, your civil war is getting worse. We might not just be students for much longer, and we must be our stronger selves when that time comes. Amisha. You both need to find your soulmates. It would have been a tidy thing if you two had paired, but you haven't. And there are two other mages out there who belong with us. And there's no way we can find our soulmates when we choose. It took ages for Dina and Teresa to bond, even though they hung out every day. Ian and Natalia say it's supposed to happen over time. Well... No, Amisha, it's unnatural. Not to mention illegal. The headmasters will put years on us if they find out. And your magic will never be at its strongest without your soulmate. We cannot risk it. We're going to the Soul Witch. Four days after news is brought of Alan's death, the students are allowed into Fairhaven with their meager allowances. Rose leads her friends to one of her favorite bakeries in town, eager for food that didn't come from the Academy kitchen. Put that money away, Rose, by the gods. Uh, two of those pies, thank you. The baker hands over two pastries and bows, but the young lord doesn't see it. Rose waves goodbye as she bites into her pie. You have to stop buying me food. I have money. And you should return as much as you can to the headmaster's pockets at the end of your studies, or they'll count it against your docket, and it's a financial debt as well as a timed one for you. I've heard about this docket thing. What exactly is it? Well, if you're not from money, you're a noble family, <coughs> like myself, uh, or, you know, Arin or Amisha, uh, you pay for your study through labor. They'll give you a number of years when you finish up. Yeesh. All right. Good to know. Good morning, you two. Where's mine? He only had two this morning. You can have half of mine, though. No, that's okay. You need it. How was sword class yesterday? Ah, she's a natural. Best of the human borns, easily. I'm not so sure that's true. Teresa is doing very well. Now, as for this morning, Tyson is meeting us there. Oh, okay. You've asked him to come. Where we're going, 
The headmasters won't see us. The guards won't see us. I thought you'd appreciate the opportunity to spend more time with your... friend. That's very kind of you. Amisha flashes a smile and begins to walk down the narrow alleyway behind her. Orin hops in to step at her side, but Peter lingers near Rose. What's wrong? I didn't know they were in contact. Who? Amisha and Tyson. And that's a bad thing? It's risky. They can't be seen together, the whole mage, non-magi thing, and and now they've been keeping a friendship somehow? He did the same thing with you. Is it so surprising he's made another mage friend? Well... What is it? Rose, what aren't you telling us? Nothing. I just... I don't like it. Amisha leads them into the commoner's district. It's an icy cold day, with plump grey clouds overhead promising snow. Rigid wind streams between the buildings and cuts through their gloves and cloaks. Rose huddles behind Peter, finding some shelter behind his tall figure. He doesn't notice until they reach their destination. Rose, what are you... Are you using me as a windbreak? Maybe. Pity I can't do the same. Rose swats at him as he tries to waddle behind her. But she's distracted by the snowflakes in his dark hair and the smile that reaches his eyes. Her cheeks redden as Tyson appears around the corner. Hey! Oh, sorry, I had to finish a commission. Thank you for coming. <laughs> yeah, cheers for the heads up, buddy. Amisha pushes open the door of the community hall, and their good-natured chatter dies away. Entire families have taken shelter inside the rickety wooden building. Cots and curtains separate the sleeping areas as a few cooking fires fill the air with an unhealthy, greasy odor. A spoon clangs against metal as a small knot of people gather around the pot. Oh my god. She... She said she'd be here. She has to stay hidden from the academy. Why? The headmasters don't like the soul witches. They're a reminder of failure. What even is a soul witch? What did, what did she do? They're mages who lost their soulmates before they could bond. Their magic goes haywire, manifests in different ways. Some of them can use it to find soul bonds between other people. It's like the gods played a cruel trick on them, showing other people the way to the bond they can never have. I've never heard of this woman. You wouldn't have. When they realised her soulmate had died, the headmasters banished her from the academy and struck her name from the records. That seems harsh. Something to keep in mind? In the corner of the ramshackle hall, a faded red curtain hides the small nook. Amisha pushes it aside and speaks with the person in a low tone before nodding back at the group. Tyson lets the curtain fall behind him, and they sit around the small brazier, waiting for the woman to speak. Thank you for coming. I am Sarah. I know what a risk you've taken to see me. And we know yours. Such dedication to finding your missing half. It is a shame the headmasters will not allow me to offer my services freely, and that we must instead meet here. Who are the umpired? I am. Me, I guess. We'll start with the one who answered second, and the reluctant are always the most interesting. She reaches across the brazier for his hand. Rose instinctively pulls the heat from the metal, her fist clenched as Sarah gets too close. Oh my... So much pride, young man. You think quite a lot of yourself. Uh, Not particularly, I just think a lot of my potential. Good, yes. And your family. Very strong. And very proud. The noise of the hall dies away as the hairs on Rose's arm stand up. The witch turns to her, eyes questioning. Might I have my fire back? Little whisper. Oh, yeah. Uh, Sorry. Rose lets the heat surge back to the coals, which flare as Sarah, still gripping Peter's hand, tosses a bunch of herbs upon them. Hmm. Human-born. Stubborn and strong-willed. Amisha, Tyson, and Orin all look up. Hey, we know it's not me. There's... There's only one human-born left. Yasmin. Her name is... That's her! Sarah smiles and releases his hand. Peter sits back, stunned. So what happens now? That is entirely up to you, young noble. You have her name, and what you do with it is your decision. 
as discussed. Amisha passes a small coin purse to Sarah, who checks inside it and nods. Now what about you, handsome? She reaches for Tyson, but Rose holds out her hand. He's fine. Happily paired. Uh, I'm not. So you're next? Hmm. Another human born. Oh, you had a good crop this year. We're very lucky to have her. Sarah reaches for her embroidered bag of herbs. In that instant, Rose realizes that amidst the turmoil of the last week, she hasn't seriously considered the reveal of her soulmate. She watches nervously as the spices crisp and burn on the coals, and Sarah leans forward to read the patterns in the smoke. An interesting match. Oh, your soulmate is from the north, young human born. No, it can't be. Not him, not Phoenix. Why, why not? Why can't it be him? It has to be someone. I won't have him in our group. I, I can't. The things he's done. Things like what? Peter. No, she should know. If she's going to pair with him, she should know what he's capable of. Yes, but not here. Think, man. How would you want to find out? Will someone please tell me what's going on? He's from the North. That's not enough explanation anymore, Peter. I need details. I need to know. Not yet. Not here. As Rose opens her mouth to argue, Tyson yells. As one, the group turns to see the soul witch grip his hand, the fire flashing with the scent of sour herbs. Non-Magi. Human born. What? Excuse me? Rose? I... The brazier explodes, sending sparks and embers around the nook. Screams erupt from the hall around them as the fire takes root in the cushions and curtains, and Rose jumps to her feet. Throwing out her hand, she feels the air sing as heat slips between her fingers and into her skin. She takes a breath as smoke fills her lungs, dissipating in her bloodstream. The flames stutter and die. Where is she? Where is Sarah? The witch has vanished among the chaos. Those in the hall around them continue to scream. Right, hoods up. The guard will be here soon and we need to be gone. Rose pulls her hood on, watching as Tyson does the same for Amisha. The two exchange words she doesn't hear. Peter grabs her hand. Come on. The five run between the cots of panicking people, bursting into the frozen daylight as snow swirls and flurries down the street. We need somewhere to hide. My forge. It's this way. The group follows as he leads Amisha down an alley. Their boots slip on occasional hidden ice, slush staining the hems of their cloaks. Snow melts on Rose's face, running down her cheeks like tears. They reach Craig's shop and duck under the door. Tyson slams the iron bar down to lock them in. Craig knows how to get in, but I don't want anyone else following us. It's my fault. I, I pulled him through the portal with me. You're really human-born? Yeah. If the headmasters find you... They'll kill him. They barely tolerate the non-magi as it is. Hey, watch it. I'm just telling you the truth, Rose, unless you prefer me to lie to you. Rose, we already knew this. We've been trying to find a way to get me home, so if anyone has any ideas, that'd be great. You're... You're trying to leave. I... I have to. He just said it. They'll kill me if they find out the truth. Then... they won't find out. Not from me, anyway. Nor I. Or me. I owe the headmasters nothing. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> we owe you. Sarah knows. You heard what she said. We have to find her. And then what? Pay her off? We could do that, right? It's among the possibilities of what we could do. But as far as I'm concerned, no one outside this room knows the truth. And we'll keep it that way. Thank you, sir. Oh, stop with the sir thing, Tyson. Amisha said it the other night. We need to be the best versions of ourselves in the face of what's to come. Alright, so it's Shop 114 Dustman's Way. You got it? 144? <laughs> 114. I've put a biscuit on top of the parcel if you get hungry, okay? Okay. Thank you. You're not sending him a field. I know, but just in case. He's small, you know? It's further for him on those little legs. 
Thank you for putting in those Zolskines candies. By the way, Tyson will love them. Mama always sends too many. She makes them herself and ships them over. The weather has turned nose-bitingly cold in the few days since their visit to the Soul Witch. Rose's talent with fire has never been more helpful, and she lights a small one on her palm as she and Amisha walk down the halls of the Academy. Will you go back to the islands when you graduate? I'm not sure. All my sisters are here, so I'd rather go somewhere new and do something different. But it's rare to travel after graduating, so only the gods know. What do you mean it's rare? Peter explained to you about the docket system. Yes? Yeah. If you're rich, you pay up front, and if not, you pay in labor. If you still have time or money on your docket, you can't travel overseas. Too easy to disappear from your debt to the headmasters. They really do run this place, don't they? Many pretend that isn't the case. Rose goes to answer, but it dies in her throat. Ahead of them, Phoenix descends the stairs and continues to the training field without looking back. Are you alright? The boys still won't tell me why Peter reacted that way. It makes me think horrible things. I'd, I'd rather just know. I'd tell you if I could. But the conflict in the North is closer to them than me. They'll tell you. When the time is right, not a minute sooner. Oh, can you believe Jatias is making us train outside in the snow? The girls bow their heads and follow Phoenix out into the weather. Ice crunches beneath their boots as snow dusts their hair. Their cloaks do little to block out the chill that settles into their bones. You're late, you two. I think you're early, sir. And yet the rest of your class is already here. Hurry up. We're sparring today. In that case, I'm grateful he's here. I think that's the first time anyone has ever said that about our esteemed teacher. Why does it matter if he's here while we're sparring? You were told that there were other magical affinities. You whisper with fire. He speaks to metal. And I don't know about you, but I don't fancy catching a blade with my cheekbone. No, I know what you mean. I can't imagine what disfigurement would do to my skincare routine. You have a skincare routine? What do you do? Uh, I don't... I don't know. I, I wash my face. That's all? Well, yeah. Take your swords from Page Great Tree and warm up. The carrier has told me we're not to be outside for longer than an hour today. With chattering teeth, Rose and Amisha join their classmates in removing their outer layers to the training uniform beneath. Rose accepts her sword from Eustace and pulls her gloves on. Oh, I hope this is over quickly. What's wrong? I've never been any good with swords. My father privately tutored me from a young age, but I've always been more of a danger to myself than anyone else. Make the power come from your hips. Come here, come here. Stand like this. Yeah, what are you doing? <laughs> your feet are allowed to move. You're not a statue. Use your whole body. And since you know how to teach this class, Evermore, you may go first. Don't laugh. You knew he was there. I'll remember this, Amisha. Choose your opponent. Rose turns away from the widely grinning Amisha to observe the rest of her shivering class. Her eyes linger on Phoenix, who rests comfortably at the back of the group. She lets out a shaky breath and turns to Teresa, who leans on the pummel of her sword. Come on. Human-born versus human-born. Let's go. You're on. The two face each other as the other students widen the circle. Rose jogs in place, trying desperately to warm up against the wind chill, as Teresa watches her calmly. Rose takes a deep breath, then settles into her favorite guard, the point of her sword aimed at the steel-gray clouds, with both hands steady on the hilt. Teresa opts for an overhead guard, her feet planted solidly on the frozen ground. We're fighting to first contact. No blood and don't make me work to hold you back, please. Remember, you're fighting your classmate, not your enemy. Both nod. At his signal, Teresa moves into action, bringing the point of her sword down and across. Rose blocks and parries, moving swiftly across the snow. She steps offline, returning the attack, but Teresa is ready for it and blocks. Not to be deterred, Rose pushes her advantage forward, winding her blade into a bind. Teresa disengages with a sidestep, and both fall back. <laughs> You're good. I nearly had you. Nearly isn't good enough, Evermore. The fight continues, with cheers of encouragement from their classmates. Rose's hands go numb from the cold, but she takes hit after hit, waiting for a moment. As the fight continues, she spots an opening. Her sword sings through the frozen air, slamming into Teresa's ribs as Jatias struggles to hold back the blunt metal blade from doing any proper damage. I said be careful, Evermore! 
Shit, Teresa, I'm sorry. It's it's fine. I wasn't expecting that. Well done. You're fast. You almost had me a few times there. Almost. Nice work, the both of you. Next pair, step up. Excellent swordmanship, Rose. I told you. You've picked it up very fast. You really should be studying war magic with talent like that. I've told you. It wasn't a very long fight. I doubt I'd do well in a real confrontation. And yet, the fight was longer than anyone expected. Uh, Teresa, have you uh, studied before? Uh, where? She raises an eyebrow at them both before lifting her sword onto her shoulder and disappearing into the crowd before he can answer. You know, I forget she's human-born sometimes. We all do. She's found her home here. Anyway, I mean it, Rose. Your guards, your footwork, your form. Are you commenting on my form? I'm complimenting on your form. Before Rose can respond, the students around them cry out and move forward. Hold, everyone, hold! Exchanging a glance, Rose and Peter push through the crowd to find a scene at the center. Blood speckles the trampled snow, the broken half of a sword blade lying nearby. Phoenix leans over the form of a downed student. I'm sorry. I'm so, I'm so sorry. He broke the sword at the strong. We need to get Carrie Bay down here. I don't know how to fix this. I told you, Rose. This is why he doesn't belong here. The dining hall echoes with the day's chatter. Students discuss the events of training practice, which ended with the other mage, Lauren of Knott's Hill, in the infirmary with the shattered cheekbone. Lauren was taunting him about Long Rock, asking how long the raid had been organized for, if he wished he'd been there. That's when Phoenix struck back. Just hit him with full force and broke the sword when Lauren tried to block. Guess he's lucky we don't practice with sharps. I doubt Dina could fix a cleaved head. I thought Jatias was there to stop this kind of thing from happening. He tried. He couldn't hold it back. Rose twists in her seat to look at Phoenix. He's hunched in a corner of the room, his plate untouched. A book lying open before him. His gaze rests on the wall as he sits, unmoving. Mail time begins as the pages move through the hall, delivering letters and packages. Rose perks up as a page brings a large box to Amisha, who opens it and immediately hands her a little pack of candies. Ooh, thanks. Your family must be loaded to send you this much stuff. Loaded with what? I think Paige Myler has eyes for you, Peter. Ah, she's only trying to marry up. I don't think she's actually interested. Amisha, may I have a biscuit as well as a... Rose cuts herself off as Peter stands suddenly, his eyes on the letter he was handed by the page. His chest rises and falls as his knuckles whiten on the paper. I I have to see the headmasters. What's wrong, man? Peter doesn't answer, instead winding around their table and striding across the hall. I'll get him. Uh, Peter, wait. Peter, slow down. The headmasters. Are you sure? Read this. Is this a ransom note? Peter bursts through a door, scaring a couple of pages on the other side. They move to stop him, but the noble pushes past them. Rose follows with an apologetic look, still holding the letter. When they reach a pair of doors with ornate brass handles, Peter hammers on them until they open. I hope you have a good reason for disturbing us at dinner. I've come to formally request that a unit of the Black Guard be sent to assist my family in Riverdor. There's nothing formal about the way you've come in here. Headmaster Ian, please. Fine. Come in. Make your case. It's my brother. My youngest brother. He's been kidnapped. Samlin is the second heir to my parents' estate. To to all of Riverdor. You are obligated to assist us. We are obligated to do nothing. Your brother's disappearance is tragic, but... Samlin Leon is four years old now. Has he tested for magic? (laughs) He is not. I told you. What... what would happen if Riverdor turned? What did you say, Miss Evermore? Longrock fell. If Riverdor turns, the Northern Fighters have access to the city's resources and arms. Holding the Lord's Son to ransom is a lot neater than a takeover by force. How sure are you of Lord Leon's loyalty to the South? Lord Hugh Leon has been devoted to the South since... Even more so than his own family? Silence fills the room. Rose swallows nervously as Ian and Natalia exchange glances. We will send soldiers to Thurin. We can consult with the established war council there. What? Thurin's on the other side of the country! That is our decision. Good evening, you two. Come on, Peter. 
Rose pulls him from the room, quickly staring him down the halls and away from the headmasters until he explodes. The nerve of them! After all my family has given, after all they've been through. Peter. The support they've given. Now they have to go through this alone, without any support. It's- Peter. He stops talking and allows Rose to wrap her arms around him. He rests his chin on her hair and holds her tightly. He's my little brother. I know. How can they? They can't. It's wrong of them to place no value on his life because he's non-Magi. I have to go to Riverdor. Think seriously for a second about what that means. I am. The Northerners have taken him to coerce my father into joining their cause. You said it. Riverdor is too big to take over by force, so they're staging a coup. They'll keep your family safe. My father will not bow to their demands, no matter how small. The Leons have governed the Eastern Estates for centuries. He will not be the one to let it fall. Come home with me. You don't know what you're asking. I'm asking my friends to help me. You're asking me to break the law. You know we can't leave. Rose, I've broken the law every day for you since we found out about Tyson. Peter. Rose. What will we do when we get there? I work with my father and the forces up there. We'll find the raiders' camp and negotiate for Samlin's return. You mean kill for his return? If it comes to it. I'm not ready for that, Peter. Please don't ask me to do that. I need your word that you're strong enough for this. And I can't give it. Not even to you. Evermore? Leon, why aren't you in bed? Peter had to see the headmasters. Then I don't envy you. Off to bed, Lord Leon. I trust you can find your way. I was going to walk Rose. I will escort Miss Evermore. Good night, Peter. He leaves reluctantly, leaving unsaid stanzas of their argument in his wake. Jatias nods towards the stairs, and both begin to walk. You all right, Miss Evermore? You look rattled. I'm fine. We just argued for the first time. What about? <sighs> Don't let him bully you, Evermore. The noble-born mages have a funny notion of always getting their way. Talk to me about it, if you must. That's very kind of you, Master Jatias. Don't read into it too much. I'm just doing my job. But by the gods, call me Jet when we're not around the others. Up you go. Rose ascends the darkened spiral staircase alone. She lies down in bed, putting out the candle that leans into her hand affectionately. And she thinks on her argument with Peter and his determination to return home. Because by the time she falls asleep, she knows that she is headed there with him. Now, Rose, I need you to organize the transport north. Me? Why me? Because you're far more cunning than I am. Well, that's a fat lie. It's not even a regular sized lie. You sneak out of the academy, what? Three times a week? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so what do you need? You will know who will help and who will keep their mouth shut. We're gonna need information like that. I'll have a chat to someone. And I'll inform Orin and Amisha of what's going on. I'm really glad you thought on this, Rose. The stable yard is busy enough that Rose can walk across it without a page noticing. Inside the stable itself, horses shift in their stalls, watching a man at the end pick the hoof of a mare. Miss, how can I be of service? This mare, can she be ridden today? Aye, I'm not sure enough, just a cleaning. Good. I'll need her tonight. And the, um... The grey in the back. The one that belongs to the Leon boy? What are you up to, missy? Shenanigans, I'm guessing. So, two horses saddled and an open gate. Is that it? Four horses saddled, an open gate, and not a word to the headmasters or the black guard. <laughs> That's gonna cost you more than coin. What are you after? Whiskey. The good stuff. Not that cheap piss they serve at the Wandering Winch. Fine, but you'll have to give me time to deliver. You know what the guard would do if they found me with it. I know what they'd do if they found me with it. After the evening bell, you'll find your horses waiting in the stables and the gate guard missing. Don't miss that window, or it'll be my hide, not yours, that gets the lashing. 
Understood. I appreciate your cooperation. Sorry, what was your name? Maurice. Though, now that I think on it, maybe it's best you didn't know. Have a good afternoon, Master Farrier. Night falls across the academy as Rose finishes packing a rucksack in her room. Her hands shake as she rolls a blanket up and she drops it on the bed. Resting her fingertips to her face, she takes a deep breath. Then, the academy bells toll the evening hour. Shit, just a minute. Where are you going, Miss Evermore? Master Jatias, uh, Jet, uh, I was just cleaning up. The headmasters know you're leaving. Then why haven't they tried to stop us? They're giving you a chance to do the right thing. This is the right thing. We can disagree on that later. Are you armed? No, I couldn't get into the armory without a note from you, and... You thought I wouldn't understand. I knew you wouldn't. You get this glint in your eye when you're about to do something idiotic, Evermore. Take this. He hands her a long, thin, canvas-wrapped package. Rose looks at him curiously before opening it, though she knows it's a longsword from the weight alone. One of my sharps. I expect it back unbloodied, Evermore. Yes, sir. Now, once Ian and Natalia figure out you've managed to leave overnight, they'll send guards after you. If you make it to Riverdor, get the Lord to offer you bread and ale. Once you accept it, you can't leave the sucker of his estate for a full day. Why not? It's an old law. Why are you helping me? Because... Sometimes... I wish I still had a reason to run away in the night. He nods at her, then leaves her to finish packing. She swings the rucksack onto her back and carries the sword at her side down the silent academy halls. Her heart slams in her chest as she reaches the stable yard. Amisha and Orin are mounted on their horses, the dim lamplight illuminating their frosted breath. Peter steps forward and boosts Rose into the saddle. When she's seated, he mounts his own horse, his eyes on the gate. Peter, the headmasters know we're leaving. Fuck the headmasters. They ride out into the night, Rose's breath tight in her chest. As she sets her sights on the far side of the town square, she is startled by Peter's horse suddenly shying from someone as a man is knocked to the cobbles. She dismounts clumsily as Peter does the same. You need to watch where you're going. Lord Leon, what are you... Rose? Tyson, what the hell are you doing here so late? I could ask you the same thing. What's going on? We're going away. You too, Rose? You'd understand if you knew- If I knew. Oh, tell me. Rose goes to answer, but before she can, Amisha dismounts as well. Tyson, why were you coming to the academy? This was in your last care package. It's not something I should own. Oh, no, you should keep it. No, he's right. They'll accuse him of stealing it if they find it in his possession. Guys, guys, hey, this is a really bad place for us to talk. Tyson, I'm- I'm sorry, but we have to go. You're not leaving me behind. He should come with us. It'll be safer. No, it won't, and he needs permission from his boss before he can take leave. Actually, Craig is up north for a guildmaster's meet. I've already got leave while he's off. He doesn't mean for you to leave town, surely. What if he returns early? I can get a message to him. But if- Maybe I'm not making myself clear. I'm not letting you take Rose without me. <clears throat> um... Well, it'll be safer for us to ride together. Um, can you ride? Can you? I'm learning. We need to keep moving. The headmasters will be on us at dawn, and we need to break bread with the Leons as soon as possible. Peter helps Tyson mount up in front of Amisha, who tentatively wraps her arms around him. With a nervous glance back at the silent facade of the academy, Rose leads them from Fairhaven and on to the great road of Lotharia. They ride hard for several hours in the freezing night, until Orin removes his scarf from his nose and mouth to talk. Peter, the horses are exhausted. We need to rest them before we can push on. Fine. There's a clearing up ahead. Come on! In the clearing, Amisha and Rose hobble the horses as the boys make camp. Rose watches Tyson light a fire with flint and steel. Give us a hand, will you, Rose? Will you be alright with the horses? Go on. 
Rose, what were you thinking? Leaving the academy? I had to. The Northerners have taken Peter's brother and the headmasters refused to help. And what do you think you're going to do when you get there? No, seriously. What can four mages do that the Lord and Lady of Rivador cannot? I don't know yet. But I wasn't going to let Peter go through this on his own. I wouldn't let any of my friends go through it. Yeah, but, uh, that's not quite what's going on here. What are you talking about? Come on, Rose. I've seen you go through all your crushes, remember? You think I don't remember how stupid you get around people you like? This is a little different, Tyson. But anyway, on the subject of crushes, what's going on with you and Amisha? I don't know what you mean. Don't sidestep me, Wells. You know damn well what I mean. She's a mage. A highborn one. So get whatever you think is going to happen out of your head before you get hurt. Just... get the fire going, Rose. It seems to be the one thing you're good at. What are you two talking about? I was telling Tyson why we're heading north in the middle of the night. I'm sorry about your brother, Peter. We'll get him back before they can turn my home city into a new stronghold for their war. Uh, Rose said the headmasters refused to help? They sent a missive to the War Council. What it said, we don't know. The War Council is on the other side of the country. You're very well informed about a land that isn't your own. Not many Lotharians can tell you where their own War Council is located. You forget I work for a Northerner. And I could say the same for you. My major is cartography. I'd be a poor student if I didn't know the basics of the country I studied in. We should get some sleep. Tyson, you can share my bedroll. Oh, I was going to offer... Oren, take first watch. Wake me in an hour. On it. Amisha, come here for a second. You're a noble woman. Remember? To share your bed with a non-major would ruin your reputation. But not you. <laughs> I'm not a noble anything. Now, get some sleep. I think the next few days are going to be difficult for a number of reasons. As they ride through the hinterlands of central Lotharia, Rose realizes why people flock to the Academy's shadow despite the headmasters. The thick forests of the south give way to stony moors and threadbare fields. A thin drizzle begins to fall as the horses slosh through icy mud, and Rose peers into the distance. Peter, can we stop at that village? That's not a village. Uh, Oren? I see them. They're not usually this close to the Great Road. They're getting brazen. Who are? Half-souls. We call them halvers. What's a half-soul? Mages, without soulmates. But you and I don't have soulmates. Theirs died after they bonded. The headmasters will move them on soon, probably out further into the barrens. Why would they do that? What's wrong with them? You'll see. The village rose spied soon comes into view. It is a shanty town of ramshackle tents with blank-eyed people shuffling about in the mud. One tent has burned, the skeleton still smoking in the rain. Most of their soulmates died up north during the first campaign to bring Orthandriel back under southern rule. The one to return came back as... this. The headmasters move them from time to time. This is the furthest they've come south, though. Why are they like this? There are many theories. Some mages took an interest in what happens after a soul is torn apart. Harvests don't feel cold or heat or pain, which leads them to falling ill or victim to frostbite. Sometimes they just lie down and let themselves die. They continue to ride past the camp. A half-soul stands to watch them, and Rose finds herself unable to tear away from the woman's intense, one-eyed gaze. Her horse turns towards the tents. Rose, what are you doing? Nothing. Sorry, Oren. The half-souls move away at Oren's voice not the one-eyed woman. She stands like stone, watching the riders pass into the veil of rain. After a few hard days on the road, the riders crest the hill that leads down into the mining city of Riverdor. Surrounded by hills, carved deep with quarries, the city is layered in a coat of silverstone dust. The rain has followed them, plastering the dust to the cobbles as they ride amongst the buildings. On the outskirts, the Lion Estate stands between the city and the moors. Peter, when was the last time you were home? The day I left for the Academy, so three months now. Did it, uh, did it look like this when you left? No. 
No, it did not. The unkempt gardens on either side of the drive grow wild and tall, and more than one horse shies away from the foliage. The manor ahead shows even more signs of disrepair. The stone fountain has run dry, and the windows are boarded against the turning weather. A small team of manservants meet them outside. Tell my mother we're here, please. Immediately. What should we do? Stay close. Introduce Tyson's our blacksmith and just... Be ready for anything. I don't know what's been going on up here. I don't have a good feeling about it. And Rose? Thank you for coming with me. Rose smiles and squeezes his hand. The five are led into the manor and shown a sitting room in which to wait. Rose fidgets in her dirty clothes, wishing they could at least bathe before meeting Peter's noble mother. Orin and Amisha drift away as Peter is summoned from the room. Tyson sits heavily in an armchair as Rose paces. You all right? Just jittery. We need to have bread and ale with them before the headmasters catch up with us. Mm. It seems weird to think that a few days ago I went out to return Amisha's gift. I was going to spend the rest of the night knitting. Oh, uh, I finished it, by the way. Tyson digs in his pocket and withdraws a small lump of blue material. He unfolds it into a beanie with long flaps over the ears and a misshapen ball on top. I got okay at knitting towards the end, so I tried to make sure your ears would stay warm too. Come here. He places it on her head, pulling it down over her ears. Fitz. Knew it would. You okay? Yeah, it's, uh, it's really nice. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm glad you've learned a skill here, especially one so handy. Blacksmithing is coming in handy too, and Craig has been training me in longsword just like you guys. How's that going? It's good. I've taken to it pretty well, I think. And have you made contact with him yet? Who? Your soulmate, Phoenix? No, not yet. Not after the way Peter and Orin reacted to his name. And with the attack on Long Rock and, well, now this, it doesn't feel right. Though I've been wondering lately what it must be like to have a soulmate. Honestly? Probably annoying as all shit. Yeah, because I have no idea what it'd be like to have some dork sharing every aspect of my life. Oh, come off it. So what actually happened when you, like... Uh... What is that? What are those hand gestures? I don't know. When you bond. I genuinely have no idea. And I'm still not sure I want to find out. Everyone, I'd like you to meet my mother. Lady Matilda Leon. A woman enters behind him in a long, regal purple dress, her dark red hair bound and pinned to her head. She stands beside her son, her eyes moving around the four who bow or curtsy to her. You are the friends my son speaks so highly of. May I know your names? Master Tyson Wells and Rose Evermore of the Letharian Academy. It's nice to meet you. And you, though I wish it were under better circumstances. My name is Amisha Nila, from the Zolski Islands, here to study under the Headmasters. And I'm... Of course I know who you are, Arrhenius Thoro. You've got your mother's hair, I see. Same as your siblings. Yes, ma'am. Is your brother still serving on the War Council? He is, yes. I was going to get a letter off to him about... It's all right, Master Orin. Your brother serves at the behest of the Headmasters, and to disobey that order would be treason. Speaking of, Peter, why have you brought your friends here? In clear defiance of Academy rules. I wasn't going to sit in that building and do nothing. Not after your letter. I sent you that letter so you could prepare for grief. Our chances of getting Samlin back are... small. You've already given up on him. No. But I am a realist. And we are at war. The country has been at war with Riverdor for the last 16 years. The country is just too polite to admit it. Come into the drawing room. The group exchanges looks and follows the noblewoman into the next room. Fine mahogany panels line the walls and plush carpet muffles their footsteps. A new fire is burning in the hearth, recently lit. Rose goes to it warming her hands with the flames that stretch tall to meet her. Though my advisors are advising me to not pursue the matter, I've been tracking him. 
We have narrowed the area down to the hollow woods. I know of the area, but I don't think it's where you're looking for. Ah, oh. cartography major. Yes, my lady. Cartography, weather magic, war magic, and a fire whisper. That's why I brought them, mother. You've also risked the headmaster's wrath by doing so, Peter. But in any case, will you and your friends accept a meal of bread and ale? We would be honored, my lady. A plate of bread is brought to the table, with maps and notes hastily cleared to make room for the jug of ale that accompanies it. They eat together, and Rose watches Tyson try not to eat his chunk of bread in one go. My lady, if I may ask, the, uh, the old lore of bread and ale with a host... Why does it exist? You're a human-born, aren't you? I am, yes. Then things no doubt work differently in your world. But here, our country in particular is savage with turns of the weather and desperate souls on the edge of civilization. To break bread with a family under their roof is to be invited into their home. The protection that grants goes both ways, both from the host to their guest and the guest to their host. Neither will harm the other or allow harm to come to either party. Those who break this old law are cursed for generations by both the land and the people who witness it. The land curses them? Much like it grants them crowns, I guess. Letharia is not just the dirt beneath your boots, young human born. Now, a mapmaker, where would the kidnappers likely be hiding? Most likely we're looking for an elite group who have done this before. Peter? That's correct. Advanced scouts who specialize in infiltration and subterfuge. In which case, they'll be cut off from their supply line. They'll need to hunt small game and to be hidden from view. Somewhere that provides shelter from the snow and ice, as well as providing a vantage point. Dead Man's Keep? No. What's a uh, dead man's keep? An old stronghold beyond the moors. Some think- The place is wreathed in bad luck. The curse we spoke of haunts the land around it. Any who set foot there meet their demise soon after. But if Amisha is right and that's where they're holding Samlin- Then I wish for them the most painful of deaths. And a quick one for my son. The curse around that land demands a soul in penance for trespass, Peter. Do not let it claim yours. I won't. Now, let us dine together. We cannot search tonight with a storm outside. It'll clear up by morning, if I'm right. You usually are. The dining room has been freshly set, and serving staff wait in the corners as the group sits. Rose rubs her cheek self-consciously wincing at the smear of dirt on her fingers. This was not the situation in which she'd imagined meeting Peter's family. Lady Leon, you, you said Salem was taken. Did they get into the estate? Yes. The walls of the estate have never been breached, Miss Evermore. But they were that night. They crept into my son's room and stole him from his bed. I can't believe those northern bastards had the nerve. I can. We woke the next morning to our son missing and a note in his place demanding our loyalty and our lands. We sent word to the headmasters immediately. And they did nothing. Samlin is not a mage. They opposed my marriage with Peter's father, Lord Hugh, even going so far as to submit a formal letter of resistance to the priest of Belitha, who joined us. Uh, I don't understand. Why would they interfere with a marriage? Because when blood mingles, it weakens. And they were concerned that joining the Leon bloodline with a non-magical one would produce non-magi children. Your father is non-magi? He is. And I married him for love. To the headmasters this May. So our calls for aid went unheeded. And we knew then that we may be loyal to the South. But the South is not loyal to us. Miss Evermore, you are new to Letharia. But believe me when I say that there are those of us who remember when Ian and Natalia did not head our corrupt government. And if they think they can let my youngest son die without consequence, and I will turn the other cheek and forget this disrespect they've shown on one of their oldest houses, they're dead wrong. 
and I'll make sure they feel it. Breakfast in the lion estate is a solemn affair. The group eats in silence, and Rose flexes aching fingers. She'd risen early to practice with the longsword Jatias gave her, feeling woefully inadequate with the weapon in hand. When Lady Matilda appears in the doorway, they stand respectfully. A group of villagers will be assisting our search on the moors. If you would follow me to the armory. They dress in light chainmail and leather armor. Rose struggles to fasten the buckle of her right bracer, and Tyson's fingers replace hers on the metal. How are you doing? I'm nervous. I'm scared we'll find what we're looking for. I know. Hey, no one's noticed I'm not a mage yet. That's a win, right? (laughs) Trust you to be the optimist. Rose, be careful out there today. Don't let Peter convince you to follow him somewhere. Before she can answer, Lady Matilda holds a torch aloft. Those of you who volunteered to be here today, I thank you. Today, we find my son. Her voice trembles, but she straightens her shoulders and leads the group from the building. The morning is dull and clouded with flecks of rain riding the howling wind. Out on the moors, Rose's hair strains to escape the tight bun she wound it in, and they squint across the graveled plains. Tyson and Amisha walk together, and Rose's eyes linger on their backs. Nearby, a cliff draws her closer, and she peers over it into the lake far, far below. It's something, isn't it? It's just me. We're all separating on the moors. But I'm glad I caught you alone. Really? Why? Rose, I know they're at Deadman's Keep. The haunted ruins? It's not haunted. The generation before ours is a superstitious lot, fed long tails before bed to keep them obeying their nannies. I'm not letting a folk scare keep me from rescuing my baby brother. If you know that's where they are, maybe we should tell your mother. You saw how she reacted last night. We need to at least scout the area and confirm my suspicions. We'll just scout? You promise? I promise. You won't see combat today, Rose. He steps closer and kisses her forehead. Rose lets her eyes close at the contact, and they stand together for a brief moment before Peter moves away. After. We'll talk. With a backwards glance at the torches of the retreating group, They disappear into the short trees of the nearby scrub. As the sun traverses the sky behind a thick layer of cloud, the two mages journey through the wilderness. Peter turns to help Rose up a small rock face, but she's already scaling it easily. Above the trees, she spies a crumbling stone tower. Peter. I see it. We're getting close. The rain lashes down on them as they move towards the camp. A stone tower standing defiant against the ages, rises from the rocky ground. Around it, men in ragged cloaks stand around a struggling fire, and mud squelches under Rose's boot as she and Peter crouch in the underbrush to observe the clearing. How many are there? Fifteen, at least. We can't fight this many. It's all right, we're just scouting for information, remember? Read eyes on Samlin. I I could give the fire inside a, a bit of a boost. Light up the tower for a moment. Do it. Make it seem natural. Rose removes one of her gloves with a shaking hand. The fire in the tower speaks to her easily, and she sends up a wash of sparks that the men don't even glance at. Her eyes rove quickly over the interior, spying a small boy tied to a stake that has been hammered into the ground. She takes a deep breath. I think... I think Samlin's with them. Are you certain? Rose, is he safe? Does he look well? He seems so. I... I only... I only saw him for a second, Peter. Where do they have him? We have to tell my mother as much as we can to plan his rescue. He's inside the tower. Near the back wall. Near the back? But there's only a post. Peter cuts himself off, and Rose dares not move as he falls silent. She can see the men moving about the camp, their weapons sharp and close at hand. They're expecting an attack. Peter, hey, no, no, Peter. Come on, let us go and get the others, please. They've tied him up like an animal. 
No, Peter, come on. They've tied my baby brother to a stake like a dog, Evermore. We can't win this, Leon. Listen to me. I've seen you with a sword. You're better than you think. You are a natural. The magic in your blood outclasses these criminals. You're overestimating what I can do, Peter. I'm not the ally you need right now, please. You're the only ally I have, Rose. He steps back, away from her hands that grip his armor. Peter draws his sword, turning towards the men in the camp and away from Rose, who shrinks back under the trees with a racing heart. You there! I demand the release of the Leon boy! Well, lads, that's us done, isn't it? <laughs> We'd better hand over our hard-won prize. Who are you? Boy, to heft such a confident request. Someone with a personal interest in his safety and the authority to enforce that request. I must say, the Lord of Riverdoor is a lot shorter than I remember. He, or his lady wife, are the only ones we're answering to, little lad. So best be off with a message for him. Rose, watching from her hiding place in the shrubs, cannot hear the words whispered to her friend by the man. But Peter draws his sword a moment later, his magic drifting in silver tendrils to the steel. Unfortunately for you, sir, I'm no messenger boy. His following attack moves faster than Rose can track. His sword glints in the rain, and blood arcs across the mud. The commander falls to one knee as Peter raises his sword high, but the man lifts a gloved hand that clinks with hidden metal as the blade makes contact. That was a mistake. His punch sends Peter flying back, and as the noble splashes into the mud, the man advances on him and draws a spiked war mace from his belt. Forgetting herself, Rose explodes into the camp, pulling the outdoor fire towards her. Cold shower the onlookers as the commander rounds on her. You brought a little lass with you as well. When he speaks with fire, no less. Two mages, just like the ones we cut down in Long Rock. We've dealt with your kind before. Rose says nothing, but draws her own longsword. Mage killers, you murdered my kin. Then the gods are expecting you too. The man charges at Rose, but she blocks his downward swing and attacks in the same motion. The point of her sword snags on his cloak, but the fabric tears and she falls back. Get the boy! The battle erupts, war magic sparking against their weapons. Rose runs for the tower to the captured boy as the others rush at her. She parries and defends, attacking without thinking, and only realizes that Jatias isn't here to stop the blow when she runs her assailant clean through. Oh my god, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry. The man slumps backwards and slides from her blade. Crimson smears drip from the steel, replaced by rushing silver light as Peter's war magic strengthens the sword. Its power allows Rose to smash through her next opponent's shield, cutting him down with an overhead slash as the wood splinters rain around him. His body splashes into the mud as she prepares to take on the next attacker. Instead, she is hit from behind. White hot pain blazes up her calf and she is already falling to the ground when she sees what used to be her right leg. A chunk, ripped by the steel talons of a war mace, has been clawed from it. The commander looms over her. Little Fire Whisper, no, this brings me no joy. You fought strong and took lives, and now I'll repay them with yours. Rose's hand searches weakly in the mud for her sword, still glittering with imbibed magic. Her fingers barely graze the hilt as the mace begins its downward swing. No! The commander is thrown sideways as both tumble into the mud. Rose wrestles upright as her friend is overpowered. Her surviving men grab him under the arms, dragging him backwards. He kicks and fights, but they're too strong. Wait. The northern commander stands, removing a knife from his ribs. He looks at it curiously. The last mages we fought did not try nearly as hard to save themselves. Love is a powerful motivator. His name... His name is Peter Leon. But her whisper is too quiet. 
and too late to save him. The knife is plunged up and under Peter's ribs. He doesn't cry out, even when the commander twists it cruelly. Beside her, Rose's sword flashes and cracks with power, then falls silent. You know, little fire whisper, I have no respect for mages. You are soft and weak behind your powers, using them as a pedestal to view the world from. But I've never seen mages fight like you did. You don't know what you've done. I'm sure you're about to show me, little mage. You don't have long left with that leg wound. I apologize. I was aiming for your head. It would have been quicker that way. He cups the back of her neck with surprising tenderness, lifting her free of the mud. Tears well in Rose's eyes as she summons every ounce of magical strength she still possesses. The mud begins to dry and crack around her. Your tears honor your fallen friend. I'd rather honor him with your corpse. The tower explodes. Rose seizes the commander by the throat as his camp burns and stands despite her ruined leg. Fire bursts from her hands and swarms the man in her grasp. Ragged fingernails gash her cheek, drawing blood, but the fire digs into the folds of his clothing, hot air searing his lungs. She holds him until he collapses into greasy ashes in her fist, scattered. There are flames in her gaze as she surveys the burning camp. The other men scream as they, too, are burned alive by the escaped fire. The trees blaze, their canopies wreathed in golden flames that defy the watery deluge. For a moment, she is tempted to burn it all. Peter. His body lies amongst the others in the mud. As strength drains from her limbs, she staggers to him and falls to her knees beside him. She gently closes his eyes. We saved him. We saved... Only darkness answers her, and she lets herself slide into its caress. The lady would like to see you. No. Miss, I'm sorry, but you... I said no. Not today. You heard her. Please excuse us. You have to let Matilda come and see you soon. It's, it's her house. Peter was her son. I don't care. I can't face her. Not yet. What about the healer, the carrier? What did he say about your leg? He says he can't fix what's not there. He might if you tell him what happened. How, Tyson? How would that change anything? We went to Dead Man's Keep. They had Samlin and we lost the fight. That's what happened. Being a smartass has never helped you, Rose. Not with your mother, not with me, and not with this. I know... Hey. I know you're hurting. I know Peter was your... Your friend. But we want to help you. All of your friends want to help you. Just have to let us. Rose finally looks at him. But she doesn't say anything. She blinks, and Peter's eyes stare into hers. Accusing in his early death. She takes a deep breath, turning her hand up so Tyson can hold it properly. He squeezes it. You know, I, I like these. The scars on your face. At least they healed up well. What are they from? Fingernails. Shit. Well, I just hope you did them worse. Yeah. I did. The door opens, and a familiar man in black leather armor steps inside. Rose reaches for the cane beside her bed. Relax, Miss Evermore. I mean you no harm. Do you know who I am? Yeah, you're the one who told Anarchy about Long Rock. You work for the Headmasters. That's correct. You know why I'm here? Sunny holiday to the north? Rose! My name is Captain Griffin Marks. I was sent to return you and your friends to the Academy. I didn't think their jurisdiction stretched this far. Lotharia is the headmaster's jurisdiction, and as soon as the carrier gives permission for you to travel, 
We'll be escorting you back for punishment. It might be slow going. Are you sure? You set quite the pace on the way here. Well, not all of me is coming back. She lifts her leg onto the covers. Below her right knee, her calf is mangled beyond repair. Magical or natural. The Riverdor carrier had neither the skill nor the patience to rebuild the muscle, and Rose knew immediately, on some primal level, that she'd never walk properly again. It is a badge of permanent failure that offers sour solace in its ugliness. It is a lesson she will never unlearn, and never outrun. I heard you were injured. I didn't realize to what extent. This is exactly why the headmasters don't allow students to leave before they are ready. I'll be back tomorrow, and the day after that, until you are fit to return. They're holding a funeral for the sun this afternoon. You should go. With Tyson's encouragement, Rose does attend the funeral. Amisha helps her get dressed, and hands her the cane that will now permanently be at her side. They walk to the family crypt with the townsfolk who came to pay their respects. But Rose's eyes remain dry beneath the customary mourning veil of the Riverdor women. As the body of her friend is locked away with his ancestors, accompanied by childhood toys and stuffed animals, Rose walks away. You are better with that cane than I thought you'd be. Lady Leon, I'm, I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you, Rose. I tried to come and see you while you were recovering. Yeah, sorry. Uh, it was all just a, a bit fresh. Your friend, Tyson, he kept the staff away from your room longer than I thought possible. He's a fierce ally to have. Yeah, he's... He's my best friend. I understand you spoke to Peter before the conflict. Yeah, I, I did. Can I know? Promises were made that were broken uh, and, and things were left unsaid when I should have shouted them. I could have stopped him. I could have done... done... I knew my son better than anyone. And I know how he would have reacted to finding his beloved brother chained up. He took you to the keep against my wishes. Everyone knows that. No, don't, don't. Don't understand. Don't, don't. Give me excuses to use, alright? I fucked up. Over and over again. He trusted you. And he's dead. Because of that trust. Because I couldn't do what he needed me to do. If you stood before me, Ho, I would believe you. But you gave up so much of yourself to save him. It's, ju it's just a leg. No. It's not. And I know you don't want this forgiveness, Rose. But I offer it anyway. It's all right. I was going... I was going to bring both of your sons home. I promise you that was my intention. But I wasn't... I wasn't good enough. I wasn't good enough. You almost were, Rose. And sometimes... That's all we can ask.